All right, good evening, everybody. We're back from our closed session uh, part of our meeting, and we'll now open up the public part. Uh, we'll start off with a report from the state attorney on those prior proceedings. The first item that I'll report out is item 1C. The city has been asked to join a national coalition of local governments, bringing a legal challenge to a September 26th FCC ruling that will curtail cities' abilities to regulate small cell wireless installations in the public right of way. At this time, council is being asked to authorize joining this coalition to challenge the September 26th FCC ruling and its impact on cities' already limited ability to regulate small cell wireless installations. <clears throat> Legal action will be filed and announced at a later date. Well, I recently wrote an op-ed on this very issue, so I will move that we join the coalition. All right, moved by McEwen, second by O'Connor. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Councilmember McKeown? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. And Mr. Shen's going to go get Ms. 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 Davis. Wonderful. I think I shortened my microphone. <laughs> that seems devious and malicious. I think I can be heard anyway. <laughs> Items. 1B, 1E, and 1F were discussed with no reportable action taken. Item 1A is anticipated lit litigation, a claim in the name of Painter versus City of Santa Monica. Mr. Painter is a former city employee who filed a claim alleging employment discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. The city disputes and denies the allegations. The city attorney's office proposes settlement on terms including resignation by Mr. Painter and a payment from the city to Mr. Painter in the amount of $135,000. Move settlement. Second. All right, moved by him, seconded by Davis to settle that matter in the amount of $135,000. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Councilmember McKeown? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. So that carries unanimously. And finally, item 1D is United States versus California, a case pending in the United States Court of Appeals in which the federal government has challenged SB 54 and two other California sanctuary laws. The city supported the state of California's laws as an amicus before the lower court, which upheld the state laws. The city has now been invited to support the state of California as an amicus again on appeal in defense of the state sanctuary laws. Move we join. Uh, move we join. Second. All right, moved by Himmler, second by uh, Davis to uh, join that uh, appeal. Um, roll call vote, please. Councilmember McKeown? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes, so that carries unanimously as well. That concludes the closed session report. All right, with that, could the clerk call item 2A, please? Yes. Item 2A is a proclamation, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So Joseph and Veronica, are you gonna come up here? Yes, Wonderful. Welcome. So, as is my custom, I'll probably skip over some of the whereas is, but whereas National Cybersecurity Awareness Month instituted as a public awareness campaign by former President Barack Obama in 2013 calls attention to the importance of cybersecurity. And whereas the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has established the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications and devoted resources solely to supporting the strengthening of securing the country's cyber infrastructure at the state, local, tribal, and territorial levels. And whereas we recognize the vital role that technology has in our daily lives and the future of our nation, uh, and whereas City of Santa Monica leadership has recognized cybersecurity awareness as a top priority, and whereas maintaining the security of cyberspace is a shared responsibility in which each of, each of us has a critical role, awareness of computer, computer security essentials will improve the security of the City of Santa Monica information, infrastructure, and economy. And now, therefore, I, Ted Winterer, Mayor of the City of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of October to be Cyber Security Awareness Month. 
Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> So this is one of those behind the scenes things that we do here at City Hall that doesn't get enough acknowledgement, but is very important to maintaining the health of everything we do here. So uh, why don't you say a few words about cybersecurity and all your efforts? Thank you. Oops. Okay. Don't have one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Council. Um, I know that uh, this is very much appreciated by the staff of the Information Services Department and all the city. And I want to thank you for your recognition of this very important issue. And, you know, our, our task is to try to make the city as secure as we can, and we take that very seriously. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity uh, to introduce Veronica Mitchell, see on my left or my right, there she is, who is our um, Information Security Officer. She joined the city three months ago, new to the city and is our first information security officer. And I know that I sleep a lot better at night knowing that she's here, so thank you. Miranda, do you want a photo up? Yeah. You want just the three of us? You want to get everybody up in front of the dais? Let's do it in front of the dais. Yeah. Come on. And you gotta, you gotta take this. Yeah, hold that. Veronica, one. Thank you. And let's call item 2B, please. Item 2B is the city manager report, cradle to career update. And Mr. Mayor and members of the council, um, this is in line with your strategic goal of a, um, a community that learns and thrives, that emphasizes lifelong learning. Uh, as you know, Cradle to Career predates um, the strategic goals, um, but is right in line with the strategic goal of learn and thrive. And so we're going to have a report on how we're progressing uh, on a broad partnership that goes well beyond uh, the city itself and includes some important partners. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Winter and council members. My name is Liz Cherie, and I am a senior administrative analyst in the Community and Cultural Services Department, the Human Services Division. I'm here tonight with my colleagues to share with you a newly developed communication tool for the Santa Monica Cradle to Career Initiative. We have spent the last year and a half engaging our community partners about the best way to highlight and promote the wonderful activities happening for youth and families, but also draw attention and solicit meaningful participation of this collective to address the challenges faced by young people. We've been intentional about expanding the membership of this collective, outreaching to more parents, youth, city, and school staff who have not traditionally been a part of the Cradles Career Initiative. A result of this expanded outreach is the creation of the new Santa Monica Cradle to Career website. And I'm going to share snapshots of the site with you this evening. The images you will see are from pages from Santa Monica Cradle to Career.org. I encourage you to explore the website on your own to get the full user experience as it'll be difficult to see some of the text here tonight, but it serves as an example of what you will find on the new site. To provide some background on how we got to this point of creating a new community engagement tool, I'm going to review the history and vision of Cradle to Career, some key accomplishments of the initiative, current priorities, and next steps, and all this information is now available online. Two tragic events impacting Santa Monica youth, a, a fatal gang shooting in a public park and a highly visible teen suicide, sparked an open dialogue between the city of Santa Monica, public institutions, service providers, and other stakeholders about youth violence. By 2012, 
this conversation turned into the Santa Monica Cradle to Career Initiative, a partnership employed to address the broad spectrum of factors that influence youth well-being. Cradle to Career is a collective impact initiative that acknowledges that no one entity can solve complex, systemic challenges that impact youth alone. Bringing together key institutions and stakeholders, this collective develops services and opportunities that ensure youth thrive from birth to adulthood. Cradle to Career adopted action strategies based on the principles of collective impact and started to measure what was happening in our community through a youth well-being report card. Each year, the data has been updated and used to drive the development of work groups, new programs, and policy advocacy. This data is now easily available to view and download on the new website. Several key concerns emerged from the analysis of the data in the Youth Wellbeing Report Card. Not all of our children are ready for kindergarten. Young people are feeling disconnected and struggle with emotional well-being. Students are vulnerable in their academic success based on their race and neighborhood of residency and our high school graduates are not entering college or careers as prepared as they could be. I'm going to briefly highlight some of the work that has been produced as a result of the analysis of the data and the development of the key goals. To address kindergarten readiness, we established a building blocks for kindergarten work group with, the par with partners from the city, the school district, connections for children and other local nonprofits. The work group is headed into its fourth year and has successfully reached over 6,000 families by distributing kindergarten readiness handbooks at library story times, kindergarten roundups, the annual arts and literacy festival, and family time groups at Virginia Avenue Park. Improving kindergarten readiness was incorporated into the city's five strategic goals under Learn and Thrive. And we will continue to assess all children in our public school for kindergarten readiness and highlight the data on the website. Another goal is to strengthen youth connectedness and behavioral health. Our data shows that over one third of our young people are using drugs or alcohol. One third report chronic feelings of depression and anxiety. And one out of five ninth graders reports having seriously considered attempting suicide. In January 2019, Cradle to Career established a behavioral health work group comprised of mental health and substance abuse providers and clinicians the school district's mental health coordinator, parents, educators, and community members. Work group members identified that adults who interact with young people want more information about how to support youth around mental health and substance use. They wanna know the signs of depression, where, why, and how are young people consuming substances, and ultimately, how do we destigmatize mental health and support adults in talking to young people about these topics. Last year, the behavioral health work group developed and disseminated a series of trainings on depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, and substance use that reached over 200 parents, city, school, district staff, and community members. Another goal of Cradle to Career is support the most vulnerable youth and families in accessing supportive services. In a strong partnership between the city, community-based organizations, the district, and the college, the Child and Youth Resource Team programs were developed and have been operating for over four years. These programs provide age-specific intensive case management and resource navigation to the city's most vulnerable youth and families. Each year, these programs grow in the number of youth and families served as the program managers have strengthened relationships with school and city staff and are therefore receiving more referrals as program exposure has increased. Last year, the Child and Youth Resource Teams served over 135 children, youth, and their family members. With this new site, you can now be connected directly to the program managers and make referrals into this program. The last goal is to improve college and career readiness. Santa Monica College, the school district, and the city partnered over the summer and brought SMC to the community with the first ever SMC course at Virginia Avenue Park Teen Center. Central to this effort was to prioritize engaging students from our out of school time and enrichment programs. As research shows that students who commonly take advantage of this type of programming have easy access to resources and are gener generally high achieving in school. Part of the intention behind this effort was to create more pathways to success for all students. Young adults can now use the website to search for job training programs, internships, and mentorships. Current priorities of the Cradle to Career Initiative include ongoing data collection and data expansion. The most updated data is the 2017 data, and you will find a 2018 report card in the coming months. The new site, with the new site, the data is easy to view, download, and share. A key tool of this website is the service finder. As mentioned, there are many challenges facing our young people, but there are also many resources available to provide support. 
Increasing exposure and ease, easing the navigation to these resources is a key current priority of Cradle to Career, as it was named by community members as a knowledge gap and therefore a strong catalyst to the development of this new website. Based on the user's need, this, this tool will offer information about services in the community that are available to youth and families. The tool allows the user to look for programs with a variety of filters, including age, activity of interest, location, provider, and frequency. In addition to the service finder, residents can use the site to connect with city staff directly, explore the blog with pertinent research and news, and view the calendar to participate in upcoming meetings and events. Cradle to Career acknowledges the value of data, and we use the opportunity of this new website to humanize the data. We have been intentional about learning the stories behind the statistics, so we made a series of videos of youth and families in the community discussing key data points. These videos provide insight into the needs of young people beyond what we have discovered through surveys and academic scores. You can see the work of this initiative as it is featured in the October Seascape, driving community members to view this new website. Still to come is translating the entire website into Spanish and up uploading the youth videos in the coming weeks. We would love to return to a meeting in the new year to provide you with a deeper dive into the activities that support this initiative, including Learn and Thrive, the Child and Youth Resource Teams, Team Programs, and showcase some of the videos that we've made. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that the objective of this website is to educate and engage our community around youth well-being, humanize the data, and facilitate connection to supportive social services and community programming. Please explore the site, get involved, and stay up to date on upcoming events, including the next Cradle to Career Network meeting on October 24th, 2 p.m. at the library, the main library. Details and the agenda are listed on the calendar section of the website. Thank you for your time and your interest in this initiative, and please visit and explore Santa Monica Cradle to Career .org. Uh, Thank you for an excellent report on that very fine work. Uh, council members, any questions or comments? I guess you did such a good job, there's no questions. <laughs> It's always the acid test. Well done. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Cole. Um, may I take advantage of uh, this being the city manager's report, first of all, to thank um, Community and Cultural Services for spearheading this community partnership and building it to one of the um, most effective um, models of this kind of community partnership in the state of California, if not the nation. Um, second, uh, this is... Um, the first anniversary of uh, Katie Lichtig coming on board um, to return to the city um, as assistant city manager. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, our deputy city manager, Anuj Gupta, um, marked his one-year anniversary with the city. And the, the team of um, Katie and Anuj as assistant and deputy city manager, uh, respectively, um, Katie as the chief operating officer, and Anuj as the director of policy for the city, um, mark a, a new step forward in trying to create a government that costs less and works better for the residents and community members of our of our city. And I just want to um, thank both of them, um, particularly um, my seatmate here, the, the chief operating officer. Um, she brought back to Santa Monica um, a level head, incomparable experience. Um, an extraordinary work ethic, um, the highest level of integrity, um, and a real commitment to moving this city forward. And for that, I think everyone in this community should be grateful. Mayor Pro Tem Davis, you had something to add? Well, I, I did want to add my voice to thanking Ms. Lichtig and actually all of our staff who work on this. Um, it really wasn't mentioned tonight, although it seems to be a very well-known fact, but I think it bears repeating as often as we can, that all of the current and long-standing research in the field of child development shows that what happens to children in their very young years sets their path for the remainder of their lives, and that there may be some people out there who wonder why the city is investing so much money in our youth, especially youth at a young age, youth during their out-of-school time, even as they get into their teens and young adulthood. And all of the evidence now shows that while our schools certainly play a valuable role in closing the achievement gap that we see all too frequently in our public schools, 
that a lot of that gap is due to what happens outside of the school year, outside of the school time, before kids even get to kindergarten, what happens after they get out of school at 3 p.m. or what they do over the summer. And so this is not just something that uh, you know has a feel-good element to it. This is something that is crucial to making sure that every one of the young people in our community learn and thrive, not just as young people, but as they move into adulthood. And all of the studies also show that for every dollar we spend on these sorts of initiatives, we save tens of dollars down the, ro down the road in lower incarceration rates, fewer teen pregnancies, more people finishing college, more people gainfully employed, less substance abuse. So this is not just something we're doing because we're nice people, although we are nice people, but it's something that really will have dividends throughout our community. Even if you don't have children in these programs necessarily, your children will go to school with children who have been in these programs and will be better for it. So again, I really want to thank you. All right, with that, we will move on to the moment everyone's waiting for. As a segue into it, I'll reveal that I fully intended to bring a prize for the shortest report on council travel, but did not. <laughs> we can go on and on, or you can accept your prize after the fact, council member. <laughs> so does anyone have anything to report on travel since the last meeting? Council member O'Connor. Yes, I attended the California Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, and there I participated in two events. One was sponsored by ICLEI, and that was a session on cities twinning with each other. Uh, Santa Monica is being paired with the city from Bulgaria, and also the U.S. Green Building Council had a session, and they interviewed me um, about the progress made on climate action and barriers and obstacles to achieving it. Then I also attended the National Association of City Transportation Officials meeting, which was held in downtown Los Angeles, um, which was really great to uh, put our region of Southern California, showcase it in terms of transportation and mobility with um, leaders from city government, local governments from throughout the country. And um, there were walk shops they hold where uh, folks uh, are toured around areas, and I know there were several held in Santa Monica. Um, there were uh, issue, um, sessions on housing and transportation, affordable mobility, and access to jobs, vibrant streets. Um, it was always great when to hear <coughs> Donald Shoup talk about parking and pricing. And um, um, a great session um, uh, on Meet the Cities with uh, posters and and staff from the various cities, there uh, were an incredible number of cities talking about the kinds of things they are doing on transportation and mobility. So it was an excellent conference, excellent group. Councilmember McKillen. Well, I, I had never thought of travel to downtown Santa Monica, downtown Los Angeles is county for the travel report, but uh, uh, I, I spent 35 cents of my own money on the Expo line to get downtown to the, <laughs> to the uh, Clean Power Alliance of Southern California meeting last week. I just want to say we are on uh, target to start providing 100% uh, renewably sourced electricity to Santa Monica by February. And you got that 35 cent ride because you're a senior and is there a better deal in the Los Angeles region? Senior off peak time. Yeah. <laughs> it's not worth doing the paperwork to get the reimbursement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I also was at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco along with uh, Council Member O'Connor. Um, it was an interesting event. I, I, if I'm candid, it was mostly a cheerleading opportunity uh, for those countries and cities and states that had signed on to the Paris Accords. There was no sig significant action that really came out of it other than to keep everybody on course. We're still walking on a knife's edge as it comes to climate change. There was a lot of positive news to report in terms of you know the great strides that China, particularly India, have made towards uh, going towards renewable energy and the, the America's pledge coalition of states and cities who at this point is keeping us on track to meet the Paris Accord goals. Uh, on the other hand, the UN report that just came out is pretty discouraging. So there's a lot of work ahead of us in this world to do with I think is a great crisis of our generation. Uh, just on a lighter note, I did have the opportunity to go up and chat with former Vice President Al Gore. He does like to be called former. That's his official title according to him. And we chatted for a while. He must have met a million people his lifetime. He, I've met him twice, but he doesn't remember who I am. And then he looked down at my name badge, and he turned to me and said, so, when are you guys going to take Stephen Miller back? <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, we're building a wall, so he can't come back. <laughs> so that's my report on travel. 
And with that, we're going to do some agenda management. Uh, council members, uh, it's only five of us. We do have items 13A to 13C, which would be appointments to boards and commissions vacancy. Uh, usually we defer that till the next time we have a full council. And seeing unless anybody objects, we will do so. So if you're here for items 13A and 13C, please go home or stick around for the exciting proceedings ahead of us. Uh, and uh, with that, can the clerk call the consent calendar, please? The consent calendar. All items will be considered and approved in one motion unless removed by a council member for discussion. And um, I wanted to state that the staff would like to pull item 3D and they want to pull it for clarification. All right, and we will start with the public input and we'll hear from Jerry Rubin followed by Denise Barton. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, Mayor Winner, uh, council members, city staff. I wanted to speak on item 3N, the contract for a needs assessment study for the Third Street Promenade. And in my unprofessional opinion, because I can understand the need for consultants a lot, but it seems like we have some pretty good experts already at the downtown district and others that know what our needs are and might save us hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, for someone to say we need a new sidewalk, I've had people walk there with me. They've been around Santa Monica for a long time, so that would be a total waste of money. I can't imagine anyone who visits from around the country and around the world or any resident saying, I'm not going to go to Third Street Promenade because I don't like the sidewalk I'm walking on. So I would say some of these ideas that come from the consultants just seem like a total waste of money. That sidewalk looks good. There's some cracks. Maybe you could put some more artwork there. There's some good stuff with street furniture and things, but that's not really what's going to bring people to the promenade of Keaton. We've got a great promenade already. It's clean all the time. It is safe. It's fun. The street performers and artists add a great element. There's some changes going on, and I would say, don't do it. We'll get through this. You don't need to waste money coming up with these cosmetic ideas that the downtown district can't expertly just figure out themselves. Thank you. Ms. Martin, welcome. Good evening. Quickly on item 3D, um, the questions would be, um, is the new pipes really for the ever new overdevelopment? Um, have you already started using sewer treated water? If so, have they figured out the way to get all the diseases out of it? And in buildings like mine that have a single water source line, would you be mixing sewage, storm water, and clean water at these locations? Then on your plans in item 3D, I cannot understand how you can rationalize making land using public transportation harder for seniors and the disabled, or by eliminating bus service for, the high, for higher price transportation services. Would you be trying to price them out of being able to live in the city, considering most of them live on a fixed income? Finally, I still don't understand how you can show preferential treatment to one nonprofit over all the others. Of course, I'm referring to Downtown Santa Monica, Inc., because they're getting over $7 million tonight. And how many nonprofits start with the tax base continue to gouge the residents? In addition to item 7K, I hope you pay close attention to previous attempts to damage Thank historical you, buildings, Martin. especially 1305 Second Street. Thank you. All right, council members, consent calendars before us. Uh, other than item 3D, which the staff has asked to be pulled for clarification, does anybody wish to pull any other items in the consent calendar? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move the consent calendar. With the exception of item 3D. Exactly. 
with the exception of item 3D. All right, moved by McEwen, seconded by Davis to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item 3D. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Councilmember McEwen? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. And now let's hear a report on clarifying item 3D. And ID, and I'm sorry, item 3D is award construction and construction management contracts for fiscal year 1718 annual wastewater main improvements. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, recommend, recommended action number four on item 3D did not state the purpose of the um, uh, professional services contract that's to be awarded. So staff would just like to clarify that that's for construction management and inspection services. Thank you, Mr. Melton. Did anybody have any further questions? Council Member McEwen. I move item 3D. Second. All right, moved by McEwen, second by Davis to approve item 3D. We'll have a roll call vote. Council Member O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Council Member Hemmerich? Yes. Council Member McEwen? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. So that passes unanimously. It concludes the consent calendar. Can the clerk call the next item on the agenda, please? Next, we have item 7A, which is a second reading and adoption of an ordinance modifying section 2.24. Point zero seven one of the Santa Monica Municipal Code to authorize as needed services agreements for public works projects. Move adoption. Second. All right. Moved adoption on item 7A by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Davis, seconded by Council Member O'Connor. A roll call vote, please. Okay. Give me a second. Councilmember Kim? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. And can the clerk call the next item, which is the one we've all been waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> next we have item 7B, which is introduction and first reading of a new ordinance in the Santa Monica Municipal Code section 10.08.565, the pier bridge vehicle weight restriction, setting the vehicle weight limit limitation of 15 tons for the pier bridge and you have no request to speak welcome the floor is yours i'll wait for the slide to pop up here glad you're excited for this uh, really short item you know <laughs> for, for the last year between this and the the police report on false alarms i just the suspense has been killing me <laughs> Well, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Curtis Castle. I'm a Principal Civil Engineer in the Public Works Department. Item 7B is the first reading of an ordinance that would set a weight limit of 15 tons on the Pier Bridge. As you can see on the screen, the Pier Bridge connects Ocean Avenue to the Municipal Pier. Certain sections of the Municipal Pier are rated at 15 tons, and because vehicles accessing the Pier Bridge could access those sections of the Pier rated at 15 tons, that's the controlling rating. And, um, we're going to recommend that the ordinance uh, sets the pier bridge uh, vehicle weight limit at 15 tons. Just a quick recap, the uh, California Vehicle Code requires a public hearing for any bridge that would be po posted lower than the lo uh, legal load limit of 40 tons. Council uh, held that public hearing on May 8th, and um, since that time, uh, that public hearing was held on behalf and at the request of the county. And since that time, we've gone back and coordinated with the county and confirmed the 15 ton weight limit and um, now we present it to you for your adoption. Thank you. Any questions? I move the 15 ton weight limit. I guess I need to move that we adopt the ordinance. Number 1009-2018. Well, this is clearly a weighty decision, but I will second the motion. All right, uh, moved by Council Member Hemorrhage, seconded by Council Member McEwen to adopt a new vehicle weight limitation of 15 tons for the pier bridge. We have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Mayor, um, I, with respect to the new ordinance, I believe it's actually Santa Monica Municipal Code section 10.08565. That's the only Sorry. amendment I'd like to make to the motion. Thank you. That's why I didn't include that when I restated it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, Council Member O'Connor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Councilmember McCown? Yes. 
and Mayor Winter. Yes, so that passes unanimously. Thank you for the staff report and your work on this issue. So next we have item 8A, adoption of an update to the local coastal program land use plan and you have two requests to speak. Welcome, Ms. Barrell. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Let me just, uh, give me a second. Are you doing that? No, give me a second. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me just get that up. There we go. Okay. Good evening. I'm Liz Barrell. I'm senior planner in the city planning division. And, um, I'm really excited to be here tonight for the adoption hearing for the Local Coastal Program Land Use Plan. Before I start, I want to um, introduce some of the team here that is with me. Um, Carrie Fukui has been the assistant planner on this project um, from the beginning, a couple, almost two and a half years ago. And we have Melis Octor from DUDEC, from our consultants, and she will be also uh, presenting as part of this presentation. Um, and Jing and Roxanne and Susan Kola and the many others on the planning team who have um, helped in this project. The last time an adoption hearing for a local coastal program was held was more than a quarter of a century ago and it was during very different times. The draft LUP before you tonight closes up significant policy gaps in the 1992 LUP as we'll explain in this presentation, the collaborative upfront work with the Coastal Commission, as well as input from local stakeholders and community members and city boards and commissions has resulted in a document that we believe reflects our unique community, our sustainable approach to coastal planning. In the big picture, what are we doing here? Santa Monica is updating the LCP in compliance with state law. The land use plan format differs greatly from 1992 when the last LUP was certified and the level of detail that was expected by the coastal plan is now much higher. The LUP planning effort connects specific coastal policies with the big picture of Santa Monica's sustainability and mobility policies. The council has adopted so many progressive policies that have been translated into projects that are improving environmental quality and getting people out of their cars and creating livable places. So in the development of the LUP, first and foremost, our focus has been to make sure that coastal zone policies would reflect the city's loose, the sustainable city plan, other adopted policies like the specific plan and the DCP. And we also had the privilege of working with and learning from environmental scientists on the cutting edge of sea level rise impact modeling and using the latest information to develop new sea level rise policies. So this is a plan that incorporates the city's progressive policies and science, um, the latest science on sea level rise. So a little background on where exactly is the coastal zone for, for those who are not as um, familiar with it as I see it in my head every day. So the coastal zone, as you can see in the northern part of the city, which is on the left as we turn our city sideways, um, goes to the city limits and along 4th Street. Then at Pico, it goes up to Lincoln Boulevard and basically incorporates all of Ocean Park. Also within the coastal zone is, is an area that's known as the area of original jurisdiction, which is um, tide lands, submerged lands, and those are the areas that will always be within the coastal zones purview. And the gray area on this map <clears throat> shows the area in which even in the future, when we complete the local coastal program and have an implementation plan, um, those gray areas, projects would still be appealable to the Coastal Commission even when decision is made by the city. <clears throat> so the LCP is unlike most documents, um, most policy developments that is in the city in which generally the council is the final, um, the final step. Council adoption is the final step. Council decisions are final. Um, the LCP is a process that also requires the California Coastal Commission to certify it and to certify that the policies are consistent with the Coastal Act. So this slide represents 
the uh, process and the relationship of the coastal um, of the local coastal program. So this the the graphic here as it explains we have our city policies. Um, our unique local city policies, and we have the California Coastal Act, which has its general policies about um, providing access to the coast. The city policies will, uh, and the coastal policies together, have created the LUP, or we've created the LUP from that combination of policies. The implementation plan will come next in the future. When the LUP has been adopted and certified, the Coastal Commission will use the LUP for its own review of coastal development permits. When the Im implementation plan has been certified and the authority transfers over to the city, then the city will use the, the um, local coastal program as a whole um, as the basis for its coastal review. <coughs> so just to take a, a step back for a moment and and we thought it might be a good idea to talk at an early point in the presentation, remind ourselves why we're making this effort. Why are we, why are we doing a local coastal program? Um, and why is the land use plan coming up today? So first of all, state law. It is required um, by the Coastal Act that uh, the city develop this policy. But secondly, it's really for us, um, it's, and, but on the other hand, that's been the truth since 1977, and yet here we are. But it is important for the city to, at this time, be adopting the LCP to ensure that the coastal zone really is regulated by those policies and ordinance that reflect Santa Monica's sustainability and mobility objectives to implement the programs that we have <coughs> and to ensure that the standard of review for CDPs is consistent with what the city wants to see and to create an active um, area in our coastal zone. And in the future, this, the other reason to do this is, is to transfer the CDP authority to the city, which will streamline the review process and will integrate coastal sensitivity into the planning process. So rather than the two-step permits, then coastal, it will all be really in one process, <clears throat> looking at everything together, which will be an improvement. So in 2016, we started this project. Um, those are 2016 and 17 are shown as two small little boxes, and then 2018 is what we've been doing this year. So since January, when the first draft was released, we had presentations to boards and commissions. We had a planning commission study session, <clears throat> and then the planning commission um, reviewed the final draft and recommended its adoption to the council on July 18th. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I forgot to bring in my water. Um, and then that brings us tonight to the council hearing. And will bring us eventually, when we have completed this and brought it to certification to the Coastal Commission, we will be, begin uh, development of the implementation plan. <clears throat> and again, full certification of the implementation plan, which is expected to take a couple years more, will then lead to the CDP um, review authority transferring over to the city. So the, um, I wanted to clarify the, um, thank you very much, <laughs> thank you, to clarify the um, resolution and the attachments for adoption. So there was a um, replacement uh, resolution that was put on the dais tonight. Basically the um, staff report included a first addendum and a second addendum. The first addendum actually is already incorporated into the final plan. It, it shows the changes between the public draft and the final draft. So the final draft that was issued in July, plus the addendum that's before you with a few typographical errors fixed in it, which are, these are the highlighted things in front of you, um, that is the staff recommendation. <clears throat> The Planning Commission, in their review, um, made a few recommended changes to um, the final draft. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of these were um, in the background chapter, so they don't affect policy, but they just affect the information that's provided as, as background for um, our, what our coastal area is today. 
the changes to the policy chapter, as you'll see in access, sea level rise, <clears throat> scenic and visual resources, and in new development. In the upcoming slides, we're showing those changes with a red asterisk. So <clears throat> jumping in to the policies, access is the first one. So the first couple of sections will take a long time for me to go through. The other section's not as long, so I just want to warn. They will not all be this long. <clears throat> but access is a major one. And the policies in this section implement the Coastal Act's mandate to provide access to the beach and the shoreline. In this LUP, we do this by providing many mobility options, accommodating pedestrians, cyclists, people coming from near and far, and people using transit or driving. The 17 million people who visit Santa Monica annually clearly show that there is access to get here. They're already coming using all of these modes, and the balance between the modes will become increasingly important in the future. <clears throat> So one of the key areas where access is important in our coast, in our coastal zone, is the pier. The pier is a very unique resource. And early on in this process, as the Pier Corporation was undergoing its design study to explore opportunities for future activity on the pier, we identified the, the need to adjust the LUP's policies in regard to the pier. So the pedestrian, the bike access policies, as you see, are pretty straightforward. But the parking, a little less so. So in regard to parking, um, this gets more complicated. The current land use plan, the current LUP, <clears throat> has, a, um, has a requirement for a minimum of 471 parking spaces to be provided for development on the pier. And then this it, development on the pier is then tied to the amount of activity that existed before the storm and based on the 471 parking spaces. So you can imagine that more than a quarter of a century later, this is a very archaic way to kind of look at whether a new development on the pier really needs to provide five more parking spaces or six more parking spaces and that kind of thing. So now the city has an emphasis much more on shared parking and on park once policies and, um, and accounting for a number um, of uh, parking spaces for specific peer activities especially doesn't make sense when people come to the pier for many different things. They're not just coming to go to one business on the pier or another. And clearly parking cannot be added to the pier. So the draft LUP recognizes that an addition on the pier does not really need its own parking, and instead TDM measures are required. So um, this, this has been a discussion over two years, and I'm happy to say that the Coastal Commission has agreed to support policy um, number 20. That number might change in the final, but uh, this policy that basically says parking, that uh, new development on the pier does not require more parking, but does require a TDM plan. Um, <clears throat> oh. Sorry, I think I, wait a second, I need to go back. Uh, how do we go back? Okay, yeah. Okay, the other parking policy I um, wanted to talk about on the pier is the requirement um, for um, exploring, um, exploring, uh, converting the existing pier parking to visitor serving uses. And um, this language that's in bold is, was added by the Planning Commission and um, does not require the city to go one way or the other, but does require the city to uh, explore the opportunities in the future. And that would mean that parking for the pier would be provided as it, as it also is today um, in the surrounding area, as well as many multimodal access points that would be provided um, in, as an alternative to parking. So that policy, we, have not had a conversation yet with the Coastal Commission, but this is the Planning Commission's recommendation and, and has been added. So going on to the downtown, so another exception in policy number 20 is that the downtown community plan area, the downtown, the part that is within the coastal zone, um, 
would not require a minimum amount of parking when the maximums would be specified in the IP. So this policy um, should be familiar because this was the council's decision when adopting the DCP to eliminate parking minimums and instead establish maximums. So this gave us another opportunity to engage the Coastal Commission staff in quite a lot of discussion. Um, I'm glad to say the bottom line is that they have actually agreed with us that this policy in the context of our unique situation and our um, um, many modes of access um, <clears throat> in terms of our parking resources as well as Public Transportation Act um, opportunities is consistent with the Coastal Act and they say they will recommend that for, present, for um, certification. So also in the downtown, in agreeing to this policy, the Coastal Commission requested that we add a policy to monitor coastal access in light of this departure from their typical approach to parking. In the addendum, you'll see that we have added a monitoring policy that adds coastal access to the DCP monitoring policy, the policy already required by the DCP. Um, the Coastal Commission have re requested something a bit more extensive. The topic was not resolved as we prepared for this hearing. So although they have not indicated agreement with the language in the addendum, uh, we have proposed it for the Council's adoption because we believe that it, rec re it reflects a reasonable and implementable monitoring policy. <clears throat> Parking pricing, another issue under access that's been um, discussed quite a lot with the Coastal Commission. Um, and the city has a policy to manage our coastal zone public parking resources through pricing adjustments. These facilities are primarily at the beach, downtown, Main Street, and the Civic Center. The city also has many on-street parking spaces. So the proposed policy requires that a coastal development permit for any change to the price of parking in the beach area would be required, but in other parts of the coastal zone would not be required unless it's required by an existing condition on a CDP that's already been issued, and there are some of those. So um, in discussing this with the Coastal Commission, they were um, interested, they were, I should say, they were in, um, insistent that we also include this last line that's in bold that says that if the city, and in this case it would be the director of, of PCD, would determine that a pricing adjustment that's not within the beach area but somewhere else in the coastal zone might affect coastal access, then the CDP would, would be required. And so we've agreed to that language and um, some last minute tweaks are needed but they have essentially agreed to this compromise language. Last issue in discussing access is the California Coastal Trail. So in um, the city of Santa Monica, that's the Marvin Browdy Beach Bike Path. The city will continue to maintain and enhance this pathway. From the Planning Commission's discussion of the unique views of Palisades Bluffs as seen from the Coastal Trail, the addendum includes one notation on this policy, as you can see above, noting that there are also uh, views of the Palisades Bluff from the Coastal Trail. So moving on, the next set of policies is recreation and visitor serving policies. These policies ensure that our coastal area will provide opportunities for all people to visit the coast, regardless of economic means or physical ability. The policies focus mostly on temporary events on the coast and also on encouraging ways to have lower cost accommodations where feasible as stated in the Coastal Act. So regulating temporary events, essentially these policies reflect the city's current temporary event policies for the, the beach and the pier. So nothing proposed here changes what the city already does in um, regard to temporary events in the coastal area. <clears throat> Much more discussion was held on the issue of what the Coastal Act really intends and requires in terms of the uh, requirement to provide lower cost visitor accommodations where feasible. <clears throat> the Commission has run into controversy in many communities up and down the coast by trying to require vacation rentals in the coastal zone. City staff has been clear since the first meeting with the Coastal Commission two years ago 
that this would never be acceptable in Santa Monica. The proposed LUP policy in the final draft and as um, amended slightly in the addendum states that the city's home sharing policy um, <clears throat> will continue and it does not change existing city policies and ordinances that prohibit vacation rental of residential units. The Coastal Commission staff has indicated that they will recommend this approach for certification. So this has made us very happy. Also, um, wait, hold on, yeah. Also key points in um, the discussion of lower cost visitor accommodation um, is the mitigation fee the city, which the city has already adopted. The city has a um, low cost uh, lodging mitigation fee, but it's outdated in terms of approximating the actual cost of building, which results in um, low fees being charged relative to um, the need for replacement. <clears throat> so, um, <coughs> excuse me, the LUP proposes to ap apply the fee to the removal of low cost units and to the replacement of any any existing hotel unit low cost moderate market rate. The full details of applicability per the proposed draft LUP um, would be analyzed as the city um, goes through the implementation fee and um, updates the fee as, as part of that. The, um, the update to the low cost lodging mitigation fee is going to be um, done as a separate effort from the larger, what we call the coastal zoning ordinance, which is the major, major portion of the implementation plan. But updating the fee is also an implementation, so it's part of the implementation plan. But I just wanted to point that out because that will um, be done in approximately six months to a year, whereas the rest of the, the effort will probably take a couple of years. So there is some disagreement still about this policy. <clears throat> City staff did not agree to the Coastal Commission staff's re request to state in the LUP that the on-site um, fee requirement would be set at 25% of new hotel units. This is a number they have required in some CDPs in other places in the state. Um, we have not actually seen an economic study or any kind of study that would show that this number comes from a thorough study and has a legal basis and we um, did not want to put anything into our LUP that we didn't feel comfortable with legally. So hence it is proposed that uh, these details get worked out in the implementation plan. <clears throat> so those were two of our um, most controversial policy areas in our um, project over the last two years. I'm going to be um, introducing now Melis Doctor from DUDEC, and she's going to take you through our sea level rise policies. These are the first sea level rise um, policies the city has adopted, so take it away. Great, thank you, Liz. Hello City Council members, my name is Mayda Sirkdar and I'm here today to talk to you about the sea level rise and coastal hazards science and policies and answer any questions you may have later. I'm sure by now many of you have seen the climate report that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published last week. This report painted a dire picture of the immediate consequences of climate change and describes a world of worsening food shortages, wildfires, mass die-offs as coral reefs as soon as 2040. The authors also found that if greenhouse gas emissions continue at their current rate, the atmosphere will warm up by as much as 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, inundating our coastlines and in intensifying droughts and poverty. So after hearing and reading about all of that, I'm sure you're all very happy to be members of a city that has taken an initiative to plan for sea level rise. To, anticipating for ri to anticipate for rising sea levels, the city has used the best available science to project the future of its shorelines. The sea level rise scenarios we use, specifically the extreme sea level rise scenario seen at the bottom of this chart, reflects the best available science and includes these new findings. In order to prepare for changing shorelines, the city will monitor sea level rise over time and has set thresholds for more 
when more stringent policies will be triggered and has set restrictions on development and sea level rise hazard areas. By doing so, the city aims to minimize beach erosion and protect its valuable coastal resources. So this, what is the city of Santa Monica required to do to address sea level rise? The city of Santa Monica has received two grants from the California Coastal Commission, one in 2015 and one in 2016. Along with meeting the grant requirements, the city must also comply with the Chapter 3 policies of the California Coastal Act, as well as the Coastal Commission's sea level rise guidance document, which calls for the use of best available science. In California, there have been several executive orders related to analyzing and planning for sea level rise. The natural resources agencies address sea level rise in their climate action plan called Safeguard Safeguarding California. The Ocean Protection Council was the first California agency to formally adopt its own sea level rise guidance. Both of these documents have recently undergone updates. That being said, the California Coastal Commission felt that it was important for it to have its own specific guidance on addressing sea level rise planning in the context of the California Coastal Act. They adopted their own sea level policy guidance in August 2015. You can see the basic structure of the document here. It focuses on planning for sea level rise in permit applications and local coastal programs. It also contains some guiding principles, discussion of sea level rise science, projections, impacts, legal context, and possible adaptation strategies. The guidance contains 20 guiding principles that frame the ideal approach to sea level rise adaptation planning. They fall into these four main categories you can see. Of the 20 guiding principles, the, most, the ones that the California Coastal Commission particularly highlights are the importance of using best available science, using a scenario-based planning and precautionary approach by examining a range of sea level rise amounts, the importance of protecting the public trust even as sea levels rise, coordinating regionally and maximizing public participation. The Coastal Commission's guidance document also lays out typical adaptation planning steps which may look familiar to you. However, what's different about the California Coastal Commission's framework is that the Coastal Act considerations are the main focus. Steps one through three are steps for typical vulnerability assessment, but the difference here is that the guidance highlights these Coastal Act considerations, including planning horizons, hazards such as flooding, erosion, wave runup, storms, and saltwater intrusion, and then the examination of the impacts from these hazards on Coastal Act specific resources such as public access and recreation, sensitive habitats, marine resources, and scenic and visual qualities. The two regional sea level rise studies that comprise the technical analysis for the Santa Monica sea level rise vulnerabilities were done in steps one through three. Steps four through six are adaptation planning in the context of the Coastal Act, which includes incorporating adaptation strategies into your LCP policies, addressing project alternatives, and conditioning CDPs. As you can see, we're currently on step five, this process. So to reiterate, in order to adequately address sea level rise, the City of Santa Monica must meet the requirements of the California Coastal Commission's grants and conform with the Co California Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission's sea level rise guidance document. The City of Santa Monica's new sea level rise policies address sea level rise in three ways. First, the policies comply with Chapter 3 of the California Coastal Act. Secondly, the policies use trigger-based approaches. And lastly, the draft LUP incorporates adaptive management programs. I'd now like to broadly explain the ways in which the city addresses sea level rise through its new policies and how it may impact you as a resident or a visitor. Oops. Sorry. So firstly, the new policies address sea level rise by complying with Chapter 3 of the Coast Act. More specifically, the policies directly incorporate four Coastal Act coastal hazard policies from the Coastal Act. Two policies in particular form the basis of the Coastal Commission's consideration of sea level rise, Section 30235 and Section 30253. Section 30235 addresses shoreline protective devices, which are things such as revetments, breakwaters, groins, harbor channels, seawalls, and cliff retaining walls. This policy gives the city authority to approve shoreline structures in certain circumstances to protect existing development, coastal dependent uses, 
and or public beaches, provided that the shoreline sand supply and other coastal resources are either avoided or mitigated. Section 30253 of the Coastal Act addresses new development and says that new development shall minimize risks to life and property, assure, structural and st assure stability and structural integrity, and neither create nor contribute to erosion and will not require a shoreline protected device that would substantially alter natural landforms. According to the Coastal Commission, these two policies that are now incorporated into the LUP taken together form the backbone of how to address coastal hazards in development. Secondly, the City of Santa Monica will be incorporating a trigger-based approach. The City identified near-term, mid-term, long-term, and long-term extreme scenarios. Using those sea level rise thresholds, trigger-based policies were developed. This means that when sea level rise reaches certain thresholds, these policies related to that scenario will come into effect. In order to know when these thresholds are met, the City will monitor sea level rise in four ways. It will keep tide gauge data, analyze pier scour to support the long-term monitoring and maintenance of the Santa Monica Pier, measure beach width, and take quantitative storm flooding measurements after major storm events to assess the impacts to assets. As shown in this chart, policies 53 through 79 will apply immediately upon adoption and will apply through all phases of sea level rise thresholds. These policies include new coastal hazards map, anticipated lifespan of development, real estate disclosures, CDP technical analysis requirements, etc. It also includes adaptive management programs, which I will discuss later. Policies 80 and 81 will apply when the mid-term sea level rise threshold has occurred at 12.1 inches. In this time frame, development will have begun experiencing some more continuous damages. The shoreline policies take these damages into account. In this threshold, the city will consider establishing a development impact fee program to fund activities and programs that address sea level rise along Santa Monica's coast. Policies 82 through 85 will apply when the long-term scenario occurs at 24.1 inches. When we have reached this level of sea level rise, much development and infrastructure will be impacted. These policies aim to ensure that the city of Santa Monica continues to prioritize public access in the face of long-term sea level rise. So how as a resident or a visitor to the city will these policies directly affect me? The land use pride, as Liz explained, the land use plan provides a standard of review for development in the city's coastal zone. As a resident or a property owner in the city inland of PCH, the proposed sea level rise policies likely won't directly impact how you develop your property. However, if you own a home or a business in one of the mapped coastal hazard areas, or if your property is demonstrated to be in a hazardous location, these policies may impact the way you're able to develop or redevelop your parcel. For example, this map, map B, shows this coastal storm flood hazard zone. If your parcel is in a mapped hazard area like this one, the proposed policies currently would require a technical hazards analysis to be submitted as a part of your coastal development permit application in order to show that the area of proposed construction will be stable for the expected lifespan of the development. Your project may also need th to be set back, recited, or redesigned depending on the susceptibility to hazards. The city will also be able to condition your permit to require monitoring or, if necessary, future relocation or removal of the structure when it becomes unstable or is unable to be occupied due to said hazards. As noted previously, the Coastal Commission Sea Level Rise recommends the use of best available science, which we used as the NRC's 2012 report. You can see the amounts of sea level rise expected by certain time steps aren't exact. They're provided in ranges due to several sources of uncertainty, such as the level of future greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, the draft policies would recommend using scenario-based analysis, which means while um, reviewing your project, you examine the potential future impacts of the low, medium, and high sea level rise scenarios to see what could potentially happen in the future and plan accordingly based on risk tolerance, adaptive capacity, sensitivity, and lifespan of the development. The third way the city's policies address sea level rise is through adaptive management programs. Adaptive management is a way to remain flexible and cope with uncertainty such as sea level rise while making necessary management decisions. 
This provides a framework for the city to manage risks and take actions based on specific triggers and monitoring of sea level rise and its effects. It provides flexibility for the city to choose from an array of adaptation measures over time as specific triggers are met. The draft LUP includes three new adoptive management programs. The first adaptive management program is a shoreline management plan for specific high priority beach sub areas to address sea level rise and coastal hazards and to adapt to changes in wave, flooding, and erosion hazards in the short and long term. The shoreline management plan would prioritize soft adaptation strategies such as managed retreat, uh, beach nourishment, living shorelines, and dune restoration over any hard adaptation strategies such as seawalls or groins. The second program is a beach nourishment program, which aims to utilize the beneficial reuse and placement of sediments removed from dredging projects, upland development, erosion control, or flood control facilities. Lastly, the city will explore the mechanisms for shoreline protection and management and explore the feasibility of adaptation measures in areas vulnerable to sea level rise. Some potential mechanisms may include formation of a coastal geologic hazards abatement district, tax incentives, grant programs, or direct cost share assistant programs for private landowners to incentivize soft shoreline management, such as the creation of new dune habitat areas, a transfer of development rights program, and rolling easement programs. As Liz noted, there was one change um, to policy 67, which is a sea level rise policy. Um, it is a policy related to non-conforming structures and hazardous location. It's been changed to clarify that if a legally non-conforming structure in a hazardous location experiences a non-voluntary fire, explosion, or other natural disaster, such as earthquakes, can be rebuilt as it previously existed. So in conclusion, the city is addressing sea level rise through compliance with Chapter 3 policies of the Coastal Act, the California Coastal Commission sea level rise guidance, and by using trigger-based policies to address sea level rise and incorporating adaptation management programs. The city's sea level rise policies aim to protect the resident and visitor recreational experience in the city by a commitment to maintain the city's coastal amenities and by discouraging the use of shoreline protected devices, which could adversely impact the beach. I'm going to now pass the presentation to Carrie. Good evening. Um, so I'll be going over the next few policy sections. They were uh, much less contentious than the previous ones, so I should be able to zip through them a little bit quicker, uh, starting with environmental quality. So Part of the Coastal Act includes protections of environmental quality, specifically marine and biological resources and environmentally sensitive habitat areas, or ESHAs. Uh, the LUP aims to protect the environmental quality of Santa Monica's coastal zone by assessing the impacts on uh, endangered species and threatened species that currently exist and may exist in the future on the beach uh, by protecting our native landscape and discouraging the uh, inclusion of invasive species and by continuing to implement best management practices for construction and new development to improve uh, uh, the water quality of our oceans. So this is done through a handful of policies. This is a sample grouping uh, for protecting the biological resources on our beach and our coastal zone. A sample policy 88, uh, it essentially protects existing uh, threatened species that have been identified, such as snowy plovers, grunion, and least tern, and also protects other sensitive species that may be present. So this opens it up to any future species that may uh, come to the coastal zone and create uh, a habitat there. Uh, this specifically protects them from beach grooming and other disturbances, such as uh, lifeguard trucks or any kind of recreation. Uh, for policy 96, this one's specific to the snowy plover protection area, which you may have seen in the North Beach outside of the Annenberg Community Beach House. Uh, this is to protect them from vehicles and heavy machinery. So it creates a training requirement for drivers of heavy machinery, uh, prohibits certain vehicles except those necessary for safety patrol and trash removal, and also creates markers and signage within 100 feet of this protection area to make sure that any vehicle approaching this sensitive area is aware of them entering this habitat. Um, as Melis noted earlier, dune restoration is a priority for sea level rise protection. This policy 101 is in the environmental quality section and allows the city to continue dune restoration projects. Uh, the past 
two years, the city has worked with the Bay Foundation to start a dune pilot restoration program in the North Beach. And it's been pretty successful in attracting back the native flora and fauna of our beach. Uh, policy 102 looks into landscaping plans to limit the inclusion of invasive species. And as mentioned before, there's this grouping of policies 111 through 122 that continues to require BMPs, best management practices, for development and new construction to reduce stormwater contamination. Uh, for this group of policies, our water quality group in uh, Public Works worked very closely with the Coastal Commission to develop the set of policies to make sure that it's compliant both with the Coastal Act as well as with the city's existing strict regulations to mitigate stormwater. Uh, next is scenic and visual resources. So the Coastal Act sees scenic and visual resources as a resource of public importance. So we address this in the LUP by identifying specific corridors and vantage points within the coastal zone that should be protected for the public. Uh, these are all public views from the public right of way. Uh, with that, we look at development as well to see how these would be impacted or how they would impact these identified corridors and vantage points. And we also look at landscaping, light pollution, and signage that may fall within these view sheds. In 1992, the LUP actually addressed this section um, but to the extent that it had a map that identified these corridors and vantage points with no real discussion of the implication of a scenic corridor on new development. So the LUP update uh, further defines what a scenic vantage point and corridor is, so the public view of a public place, and proposes policies to mitigate the impacts that new development would have on these view sheds. Uh, in addition to that, we propose new scenic corridors and vantage points. Oceanfront Walk is one per the recommendation of Planning Commission. In addition to Tongo Park Overlooks, the Colorado Esplanade, the Main Street Bridge, the Pier, and the 4th Street Bridge over Ocean Park Boulevard. Uh, here you can see a sample page pulled from the LUP, LUP Chapter 3 of the Colorado Esplanade Scenic Study. So you can really see how we specifically called out what we we're preserving from this view corridor. So the visual connection from the Expo Terminus down to the Pier, the Yacht Harbor sign, the ocean, and the Pier entrance, and what we're explicitly not including in this protected view. So the private development outside of the public right way. Uh, so some policies that were put into place to protect these scenic resources, very straightforward, number 142, just identifying and designating these scenic re uh, resources to be protected. Uh, new development within these view, sh view sheds are to be designed to be visually compatible with the surrounding area and character. Uh, the Planning Commission suggested to add that there's a public review component for any public works project that also may impact a vantage point or corridor. Uh, so there's also a site-specific requirement for any development within a designated view. And then policies 156 and 157 address signage and light pollution that may impact a view shed. And next is cultural resources. So the Coastal Act sees cultural resources more as a prehistoric, archaeological, or paleontological resource within the coastal zone. So their goal is to really identify, evaluate, and protect these resources during construction activities, and to include specialists that would better be able to identify them. Uh, they're not very common issues to come up in Santa Monica, so it was a very easy uh, discussion with them to include their recommended policies into the LUP. Uh, we did have one point of conflict with them, which was to address Mexican fan palms and Canary Island palms. Uh, these are two palm species that are very common in the coastal zone, specifically in the historic landscapes of the Palisades Park and City Hall. Uh, they're seen as contributors to these two landmark places. Um, but the Coastal Commission sees them as invasive species. So we propose these two policies to allow them to be replaced in kind at these two specific locations in order to protect the historic landscape. Um, we've proposed this language and they've accepted the policy. And you can see the two policies prior to that are just examples of how the Coastal Act protects archeological and paleontological resources in the coastal zone. Thank you, Carrie. So I'm just going to wrap up our last category, which is new development. And essentially, these um, 
policies are to incorporate the development policies that we have in the city already through the loose the zoning ordinance and our specific plans which combined um, result in the LUP some of the new <clears throat> development policies there are a couple that were added by the Planning Commission as you see here with the asterisks and um, I will actually skip through these very quickly but most of the policies do apply to generally to all areas but some of them apply to specific sub areas <clears throat> the idea is to keep those actually fairly limited because we have plenty of policies and uh, zoning requirements in all of our um, coastal areas um, and the idea here is just when there is a specific coastal um, sensibility that needs to be added in that would that has been added in <clears throat> um, I don't know why that says cultural resource policies okay well I'm going to skip to the to the recommendation and our recommendation is that the council adopt a resolution approving the local coastal program land use plan as presented which includes the addendum as I um, explained it earlier so Thank you very much for listening to our presentation and considering this important policy document. Thank you, everyone, for the hard work on that. Uh, let's start and see if uh, anybody at this point on the dais has some questions of staff. Councilmember McEwen. I do, and forgive me, it goes almost all the way back to the beginning of the presentation. There was a map that you showed of areas along the bluffs and a little bit inland that will not be covered by the local coastal plan. And it was a black and white map, and I think it said draft yeah. on it. Oop. And I just wanted to see that again closely, if I could. Okay. Um, there oh, has been some concern expressed to me by members of the public who are worried about what might happen along Ocean Avenue, that our local coastal plan would eliminate any protections for the Coastal Commission on development along Ocean Avenue. And that's not the map. That's the map. It <coughs> looks to me, that shaded area, mm -hmm. that any any development along Ocean Avenue is going to remain under the jurisdiction of the Coastal Commission whether we have a local coastal plan or not is that correct um, not not exactly but any area any um, property that is within 300 feet of the bluffs and that would include the um, east side of Ocean Avenue is in the appealable area <clears throat> so the city would actually um, have the authority to issue the CDP but it could be appealed to the Coastal Commission. So for those members of the public concerned about the, uh, the skyline along Ocean Avenue, the ultimate jurisdiction of the Coastal Commission remains on appeal even as on we appeal. do this. Correct. Good. Thank you. Council Member Hamrich, you pushing your button? Uh, I am because I have a, a question about something that's been in front of the Coastal Commission for quite a while, and I wonder if it affects uh, this plan and that is the shore hotel so so you're asking if the adoption of this plan affects the ongoing issues at the shore hotel yes um, and it does not because the shore hotel has already um, that that process has already occurred well but it's not over I, yet right um, I'm I'm looking over to even because I think our Attorneys have been a little more involved in the ongoing saga at the Shore Hotel. Councilmember, it's our understanding that there is ongoing litigation with the Shore Hotel and the, Sh and the Coastal Commission, and that will remain, and this plan does not change litigation posture. And it doesn't change the, their jurisdiction over that hotel? No. Thank you. <clears throat> so I have a question. One of the issues you identified as still sort of in play with the commission was the definition of demolition. Could you elaborate on yes. that a bit? Okay. So um, the the issue here is that the, we have a, def a, a very complicated definition of demolition that is in our zoning ordinance. This is what we have proposed um, for the coastal plan, basically to cut and paste our demolition ordinance into this and the reason is because we um, believe that demolition should be um, regarded equally in all parts of the city and the coastal zone doesn't need to be different 
the main concern as we understand it of the coastal commission is that if the that our demolition ordinance looks at over a period of five years if you demolish incrementally that and get to over 50% that's considered to be 50% and therefore it's a demolition and that's over a five-year period they would like to have that period be basically dating from 1977 when the Coastal Act was was adopted and we understand the concern that that drives that in terms of the areas that Melissa showed you in terms of in the coastal hazard areas and that they don't want a structure to be eligible for a seawall that could alter the the beach in a negative way and so demolition they want it to be a much stricter definition the language they proposed we think was much more far-reaching than than that and so we weren't able to really reach agreement on a different definition we think we will continue to work with them through the certification process but our our main goal in having those discussions with them will be to narrow the impact to those areas where they have greater concern due to sea level rise and not have unintended consequences on other properties so then take a step back so if we approve this document this evening and then it goes to the actual Coastal Commission itself rather than the staff and we are unable to work out any of these sticking points what happens then so so the Coastal Commission will make their decision about certification either as presented or with changes if there are changes it goes back to the council and the council has to I don't remember the technical term but essentially they have to agree they have to the council has to agree to accept those changes they put in if we don't accept the changes they put in then I think we don't have a certified right LUP well you know I mean I feel strongly about a lot of the issues that we have contention with I'll just say that we have a very complicated definition of demolition as you know it doesn't mean it's the most effective definition I've seen it fall short in terms of protecting homes that are on the historic resources inventory because they have been modified over a period prior to the five years that we look at so there's this incremental degrading of historic resources and I recently discovered it's not working terribly effectively in some instances for requiring net zero energy and and you know it new single-family home remodels so my inclination to be is if everything else is working our way let's not fight too hard on the demolition definition if we can get to a point where there's a reasonable compromise okay I should also had I forgot to say that I know that staff is working we are working on possible changes that would come forward to the council for the demolition ordinance and I believe those are coming up in the couple of months in maybe next month or the month Keeping after the workload let's just say they're coming sometime in the relatively near future in the near future <laughs> and when they do come forward and the council if the council were to adopt a change to the demolition ordinance then as it goes through certification we will give that revised language to the Coastal Commission and ask them to incorporate that rather than what we currently have in so we will try to keep that to be consistent all right thank you any other questions at this time oh, <coughs> councilman McEwen I want to follow up on the question I had about the appeal process in some cases um, in our system if a landmark is appealed for the uh, appearance that would normally go to the ARB it goes to the Landmarks Commission instead not in addition if the Coastal Commission retains appeal power on mm -hmm. projects along Ocean Avenue does that mean that a project that is approved by the Planning Commission and is appealed would be appealed to them instead of the council or would it come to the council and then we would be appealed mm -hmm. to the Coastal Commission so there's some nuances in that in this in that um, there's planning permits right development review development agreements CUPs those do not go to the plant to the Coastal Commission the Coastal Commission only reviews coastal development permits so if a, you ha if we had a project so we're thinking in the future here right the future after the implementation plans been approved certified you know now the city is the authority and a project goes through within that appealable area 
the council approves it or the planning commission approves it um, doesn't necessarily have to go to the council, maybe. It could be approved by the planning commission. Um, let's say that that gets appealed to the Coastal Commission, then what would be appealed would be the CDP. So not all the rest of those planning permits, just the Coastal Development Permit because that's the only area they have jurisdiction over. And the findings for the CDP are what would be looked at. So the appellant would have the choice of deciding which body to appeal to? No, no, no. The appellant, say from the plan, if it was a planning commission decision, it would be appealed to the council. Um, if a final decision happened at the planning commission and it wasn't appealed, and then somebody wanted to appeal the CDP just to the coastal commission, they would not be appealing the entire project per so se. Just, they would be appealing the coastal, the coastal development, development permit. permit. Part of it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll now hear from the public. We have Denise Barton for two minutes, and then. Jennifer Johnson is donating two minutes to Paula Larmore. Is Ms. Johnson here? Yes, you are. Welcome back, Ms. Barton. Good evening. The city says it posts all information for city council meeting 72 hours before the city council meeting. Yet for tonight's meeting, that's not what happened. Due to, all the, due to not all information being available for items 8A and 8B, and item 8A, the blue lines to the changes did not work, as in the other staff reports tonight, except for items 8A and 8B. Then in item 8B, it references an attachment A, again in blue, as a link that does not exist either. With this information, one would have to wonder why items 8A and 8B were so were not pulled from tonight's agenda. I had to make a complaint about it, but when I tried to get information before tonight, I feel I was given the runaround by the city attorney's office, the city manager's office, and the city clerk's office, who is responsible for posting the agendas. And if, all, and if this is the way you treat disabled residents, then why would anyone think you would treat other disa disabled people differently, which would cause one to question references in the plan to about universal visa access and ADA compliance? It also does not mean you, you'll do it. And I say this from the personal experience you all have done to me. Then if you look at it realistically, if you were really going to follow the coastal plan in front of you tonight, your previous actions do not reflect that because my building, the Gary Project, and the Miramar plan are all over the three-story height limit in the coastal zone. You also seem to be acting like you already have approval for this scheme by the way you disregard the present coastal land use plan. So I hope everyone can see what a corrupt racket you're running by not including all the information to the public or easily on this item, as well as making one wonder what you're really trying to hide besides misrepresentation of the status of the city. Thank you. Ms. Larmore. Good evening, Paul Larmore with Harding Larmore, Kutcher and Coastal. So I have one request tonight, which I think it's pretty good given the length of the document you have and I think it reflects staff's hard work and also the Planning Commission's hard work on this document. It's item 32 in your addenda to the final draft LUP and it pertains to the low cost lodging fee. Prior to release of the staff report on Friday, staff's position publicly had been that the low cost lodging requirement would only apply to projects that remove low cost lodging our firm agreed with this position, and this is the position that was presented and recommended by the Planning Commission. Staff's new language requires a low-cost lodging fee for projects that replace existing market rate, even luxury hotel rooms with new market rate rooms. Without waiving our firm's legal position that there's no basis for such a fee when no low-cost lodging is being removed, we ask that the council revise the new policy language to be clear that it only applies to the net new hotel rooms. So if I have a project that has an existing 100 hotel rooms, I'm replacing it with 120, the fee would only apply to the 20, not the 120. In communications with both city staff and coastal staff, we understand that coastal staff appears willing to support this clarification, this position. We ask that you add this in the LUP tonight and not defer it to the IP, where I understand it could be clarified, but it's so important to these projects that I ask you to add it tonight for two reasons. 
One, there's a minimum of, say, several years between tonight's council adoption of the LEP and final certification of the IP. So there will be projects, um, to Council Member McEwen's point, that are likely to retain coastal jurisdiction over because the IP won't be certified for some time. Also, the fee amounts being discussed are over six figures per room. So this can make a, a huge difference in projects. On any particular project, there's a set amount of community benefits that a project can tolerate. Thus, if the low cost lodging fee is so high, it's going to reduce what this city is going to get in its other community benefits. The DCP and LOOSE prioritize affordable housing, deed restricted housing for income qualified tenants, transportation impact fees, early childhood initiative contributions, publicly accessible open space, park fees. By contrast, there's no requirement that the low cost lodging fee be used for hotel rooms that are deed restricted to low income visitors. The clarification that the fee only applies to the net new will assist both the city and applicant in achieving these other important community benefits that are priorities under both the DCP and the loose. We agree that there are lots of clarifications with respect to the fee, including the fee amount and whether it's going to be adjusted for CPI, etc., that are appropriately deferred to the IP, and we're not asking you to agree upon or set a fee amount tonight. We're only asking you to please clarify the net new issue. I've passed out language. Um, for the council's consideration. And again, our understanding that is that coastal staff's open to supporting this position. So we're very hopeful that this won't add any controversy with coastal. Thank you. Council member Hemorich has a question for you. Um, sorry, good evening. I actually have two questions. Okay. So my first question is, did you not see the new language until today? I saw it on Friday. At 4 p.m., 4.15, the staff report was posted, so I probably saw it about 11 p.m. Friday night. So, uh, so, but it was posted on Friday night? Right. So, uh, but, but uh, Ms. Barton testified about something that wasn't available until today or yesterday. Did that, are you aware of that? I personally, on my computer, was able to open the attachments once they were posted okay, on Friday so, afternoon. So you, yes. there were 72 hours for you? For, yes, yeah. Okay, and um, uh, so if we did what you say, wouldn't it allow an operator who knows that they're going to be um, uh, modifying their facility to just jack up the prices in the little bit of time before they're applying for the demolition and then uh, claim that all the rooms are exempt? What would prevent that? Do you understand what I'm saying? I know? guess I just think that body, there's so few hotels. I mean, I can't even think of one that qualifies for the low cost definition. I'm really talking about existing market rate luxury hotels. They're already existing market rate luxury. You could put a date on it, existing market rate luxury, luxury hotels as of today, if you wanted to avoid that issue. That's that's what we're concerned about. Okay, so you're just concerned about hotels that are already charging a thousand bucks a night. Exactly. Okay, and uh, <laughs> so it wouldn't apply to the hostel, for instance. On right, that that's covered under the other provision that says right. you have to pay the fee if you're removing low cost lodging, and um, we're not opposing that or making any comments on that. So, what do you think should happen? I'm just trying to understand. So, if somebody uh, replaces 100 units of $1,000 a night housing with 150 new units. What, so it applies to the 50. It only applies to the 50. Right. And the fee amounts to be determined. It's just, you know, I think you guys prioritize other community benefits that I think many would argue are more meaningful for this community. Um, number one being affordable housing. You think? So it's a, So I just think giving kind of the leg up going in that it's only on the net. And I think coastal staff's very open to this. It just seems to me like I don't understand a resist why there would be a resistance to this clarification. And, and what happens to the units that are now uh, supposedly um, uh, either corporate rentals or, or, uh, or rent control units that are actually being used as the equivalent of, um, of uh, hotel rooms? I think that's a different compliance issue. I'm only talking about legal hotels in this city. Great, thank you. Thank you. So 
When we did the downtown plan, I actually suggested that when we look at possible revisions in the future that we missed an opportunity to provide low cost accommodations in the downtown plan. Um, because I think that while we want to be an inclusive and diverse city, not only for our resident population, we also uh, want to provide opportunities for people from all walks of life to come and visit our city. It's one of the things that, you know, we always try to do with the peers to provide low cost entertainment for visitors instead of everything being overpriced. Um, so I'm sort of sympathetic to the idea that we should address this. It does appear to me that, you know, it's still a point of conflict with the Coastal Commission, primarily because they have that 25% requirement that's not based on any definable nexus study. And in addition, we don't really have any sort of standard for what affordable lodging is. You, you can't use, you know, 60% of AMI for housing costs or anything like that. So it may be a gray area um, that gets worked out in conference with the Coastal Commission that we can't really agree on or we agree on something that's different than what's proposed now by the Commission. So why would we rush into doing this now as opposed to waiting for the impl implementation plan? Actually, We don't even know what the cost of that fee might be since we haven't done any sort of study. But my understanding is actually this is a compromise position, this language between the city staff and coastal staff, which is why I think it is new since the planning commission before the city's position was, we're only gonna do it if you're removing. Now the city is saying, we're gonna apply the fee also if you're removing and replacing luxury market rate. So um, while I disagree with that, that new language, if you added the clarification on net new, it would take the sting out of that and possibly get you an adopted LUP that people would tolerate, I mean, that it would work, right, without opening the floodgates to a lot of concern about the language. Council Member Rich? Uh, yeah, that's a good point, um, Mayor Winter, and I'd like to follow up on it because with our emphasis on preservation, if we allow you full credit, on all the prior luxury units and don't have the 25% requirement, then basically we're allowing a kind of end run around, uh, you know, the preservation requirements because a 1,000 unit in a building that was built in 1950 would become a $2,000 unit or a $3,000 unit in, in a newer building. And, uh, and I agree with Mayor Winter that I think that 25% in this particular area, I mean, we thought that that was reasonable for affordable housing. In this area where people are charging what people charge a month in housing, they charge it a night, why wouldn't we abide by the 25%? And, and I wonder why it is, and maybe staff can tell me why that's a bone of contention. My only concern would be why would a property owner then want to, I mean, you're at some point, right, there's a feasibility issue, you have an existing profitable hotel, but you need to, like, replacing a hotel is done to ensure long-term longevity of the hotel, which I think is a benefit, so. <clears throat> so, to answer your question, um, staff's resistance to this policy proposed by the Coastal Commission is because we have not seen enough um, evidence that the 25% has, is based on some kind of study that, that um, relates to either feasibility or to, um, to um, need. So I mean, when we do a fee study here and when we set some kind of, you know, the affordable housing policy, it's based on a lot of research, a lot of study analysis, et cetera, um, and uh, legal connections so that by the time we adopt a fee, we we and our city attorneys feel very strongly that 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 has a legal basis which is to say it's not that we're opposed to the 25 percent number we just don't know in this moment if it's the right number or not and we believe further study is necessary to determine whether it would be Can yeah. I ask a follow -up to that? um and uh who is it to determine whether the 25 percent is 
the right number, the wrong number, you know, I mean, it could be too low for all we know. Is it a burden on us or is it a burden on the Coastal Commission or is it somewhere in between? Right. Well, well, we actually have another grant from the Coastal Commission. Um, right now it's a $100,000 grant, I think, on this um, and on your last agenda, you've approved our request for another 75000 that we're hoping to get. Um, those are funds that partly will be used for doing the, the implementation. They're for the implementation plan. They will partly be used for the lodging fee and partly for the coastal zoning ordinance. So, so we won't know that until, um, we, we won't know until later on. So we're just right now just saying we need a, a better basis for this. Right. We want to figure this out in the implementation plan and then go to the certification to Coastal Commission for that fee. Thank you. Well, can I follow up? So, I mean, this is new language in amending the plans for the uh, the, the the mitigation fee for low cost lodging. It used to be just applied to replacement of if you replace low cost lodging with higher price lodging, you had to pay the mitigation fee. Right, that's what our and, current and now staff is proposing mm -hmm. this new language. It would also apply to market rate. Logic, right, and this is a, a compromise with the Coastal Commission's proposal, um, which they wanted it to apply to all new hotels. So whether, like, if you had a vacant property or a, an office building you were tearing down to build a hotel, that the fee would apply there and not just not to where there is right now existing hotel units, um, and which we also really um, had problems with both as planners and as attorneys. <laughs> Speaking of and attorneys, the attorney will speak on I just wanted to clarify that while we have a mitigation fee, what the Coastal Commission staff is asking for is more like a regulatory fee because it would be mitigation if we actually removed the units or if there was some nexus in removing an existing unit which caused a demand for the low cost accommodation. So what they're asking for is more of a regulatory a regulatory fee which still requires feasibility uh, because the the Coastal Act does say that it does require feasibility so again we are not saying that the 25 percent is wrong we're just saying that we would like to do that determination because the Coastal Commission staff has said that they believe the 25 percent fee is correct and therefore they're putting the burden on us to show why um, it is not a feasible percentage Well, let's give Mayor Pro Tem Davis a shot. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this 25% fee has this made up out of whole cloth air to it, as far as I can tell. But, but one of the issues I have, and I fully support the idea of, of trying to promote the creation of opportunities for moderate visitor lodgings in the okay. coastal zone. But unlike, for example, deed restricted affordable housing, where we can put income requirements on the people who are living in those units, I mean, I, I can't imagine that we would want to see someone's tax returns before we let them check into this the, this supposedly affordable lodging. And so that's one of the issues I have: is is just because the lodging is affordable doesn't mean that people of more modest means are the ones staying in it. Am I missing something? Is there some other requirement we can do um, to sort of connect those two dots? Uh, no, you're not missing something. And, and no, there is no requirement we can do because the Coastal Act specifically precludes the Coastal Commission from making any requirements of, or, of the people who stay in the low cost. Um, so that's actually in the Coastal Act. So, so even if we put this, I mean, it, you know, it, some try and do something to promote the creation. Right. And like I said, I totally support that because at least people might have the op option. This feels a little bit like Ticketmaster and getting tickets for the, you know, Taylor Swift concert, right? Somehow right. it's always the people with money who get the good tickets and then right. get to scalp them. It doesn't seem like the people who really need face value tickets get them. Right, so um, it's not really about, like, say, per, um, providing equivalent units that would be expensive units and saying, you you know, some of them will be, you will just charge less for them. It's really about uh, providing a form of accommodation that is less expensive, like, for instance, youth hostels or in other communities, camping or RV parks or things like that, places that 
by nature will be more affordable um, and provide those opportunities. And um, so the idea also is that with this fee that would be paid, and, and we have, we actually have collected that fee, so we actually have fees available um, currently, but any additional fees that would be paid into that fund would be used for diff, you know, types of accommodation, either expanding or new uh, existing ones or new ones that um, provide different opportunities. And then let me be clear, because I just want to make sure I understand, is that uh, the proposed language that Ms. Larmore has, which basically says whatever the fee is, and however we determine what it is, will only apply to new net new hotel rooms. It sounds like the Coastal Commission is already okay with that. Is that correct? I don't know that to be correct. I believe okay. these are discussions that, that her office has okay. had with the Coastal Commission in regard to their project. Um, that's not a discussion that staff, uh, city staff has had with the Coastal Commission. Okay, so so city staff doesn't know one way or the other whether right. or not Coastal Commission. Right. Okay, great, thank We're, you. Well, so city staff proposed this language that, that came out on the revisions Friday afternoon that included putting the fee on new hotel development, correct? Um, I believe, yeah. Mr. Mayor, that city staff proposed uh, the fee, but that the new language uh, with the red marking is from Ms. Larmore. I understand that. Okay. So she is objecting to the existing language to say it would apply to all new hotel rooms, pocket rate hotel rooms. That's right? correct. Yeah. So we really haven't had a time to weigh the pros and cons of this, at least the staff has not. So the, the, the language, yeah, that was just passed out tonight. I did want to clarify that we, we have had discussions with coastal staff about the, the net new um, in, in concept, you know, in, in the course of discussions about the lower cost accommodation, you know, we, we did ask, you know, do you, do you in, did you intend for this to apply to like all of the rooms or just the net new? And they, the, the staff told us um, net new. Now, you know, that's just the staff talking. Obviously these, you know, whether it's individual projects or what have you, that goes to the Coastal Commission and ultimately, you know, the commission, the voting body has to make that decision, but that's the initial um, uh, information that we got from speaking with Coastal staff. Well, yeah. can I just ask a follow-up then? So, so, I, so it sounds, but does the city have any objection to the net new formula? It sounds like, sounds like, Coastal Commission may be okay with it. Right. How's the city with it? I mean, I, I, or I how's staff? As, with as it? a staff, I don't think we, we have an objection to it. Um, you know, since this is uh, you know dealing with hotels within the coastal zone, and you know, in discussions with them, we want to be consistent in the application of it. Obviously, um, our, our reticence in putting it into the LUP is because it is. We thought of it as an implementation detail, and as Liz was saying, we are moving forward with the low cost lodging uh, mitigate. Lodging fee, we're going to do that study, you know, well ahead of the rest of the coastal zoning ordinance, so to speak. So we don't look at it as a two year time lag. It's going to be, I think, much more, much sooner than that because that's a fee that we have to update. Okay, great. Thank you. Council Member Hemrich. Mr. Mayor, oh. if I could jump in just as a matter of process, I want to be sure we're through public comment. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, and whoever wants to talk about this, but so with uh, uh, a project like the Miramar, where you have only one, as proposed right now, one new hotel room and 60 condos or whatever it is, how would this impact that? I think that's where, that's what I mean, is that we talked about it in concept, right? Not. A specific project we have to recognize that some of the projects that are going through there they're negotiated development agreements and what have you um, you know so even as a city you know we will balance and weigh all of the various community benefits I don't you know we're not talking about any individual project here tonight but like I said just in concept when we asked the question we didn't ask about any specific project um, that would you know, an, an applicant might have asked that, but as a staff, we certainly didn't ask that question. I'm just asking in concept. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have all these rules about, um, we, ha we have these various rules about reasonable accommodations. I have another couple of questions mm -hmm. about this. Um, but, uh, but if you have a combined project that has both 
you know, condominiums and hotel rooms, how, how did the affordability requirements of the Coastal Commission play into our affordability So, so, so the, 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 we're just talking about the, the lower cost lodging, so it's just hotel rooms. Condos are a whole different matter, you know, th th that's not lodging um, within their they definition the, of that. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, are they in our plan? Uh, because uh, isn't there some um, uh, provision in the uh, plan about how affordable housing should be, regular housing should well, be? Well, it carries, so the, the LUP doesn't change, for example, the city's AHPP policy or what have you. I will note that the Mellow Act does not apply to Santa Monica. We don't have 50, um, you know, 50, know, 50, 50 acres of vacant or property, or you know, we're not or that or big a city. Um, so, you know, in terms of that, it, it doesn't change that the city's affordability requirements at all. Um, well, the Mellow Act would probably make our require, would require us to be more stringent rather than less if it did apply to us, yeah. yeah. But, um, and the airport, because it's not within the coastal zone, does Way out count? of the coastal zone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so uh, my next question is about Airbnb because we've read in the paper about all of the issues about Airbnb in other cities and are, is the Coastal Commission accepting the sort of home sharing notion that we have adopted in res with respect to Airbnb? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I don't, you know, I think there's a lot of complex com complications with the idea of just even dealing with the Coastal Commission's plans for low-cost lodging, right, and that whole 25%, whatever. I, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this language revision. I just been brought up to us, and I'm struggling to find the specific place where the original language was in the plan, as opposed to this red line version that's been presented to us by a member of the public. I'd just like some clarification on what the original language says. Paul, so I, I think just to clarify, the original, so wh where it started is what the existing requirement is now, which is there is a fee that applies to the removal of any uh, lower cost lodging in the coastal zone. So um, the Shore Hotel is an example of that. We have had others. Um, and as Liz indicated, we have collected fees over the years for the re removal of that low cost lodging. Um, where we are now is that um, the Coastal Commission has progressively been imposing this 25% requirement on individual CDPs. Um, they have been attempting to put this into um, LCPs for coastal cities up and down the coast. Um, it has uh, been an interesting process, you know, as we've learned about, you know, how it actually works in terms of a policy as opposed to a condition of approval on an individual um, CDP in and of itself. So. Um, you know, th what they tried to do is basically take what would have been an individual conditions of approval and put them into policy in uh, LUPs. Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of discussion happened about how is this legal, you know, what is the basis of this percentage and what have you. Um, the Coastal Commission actually, where we are now with this language, it's quite a compromise from where they came from because they started with any new hotel. Um, and their, the, the, the concept that they were coming from was like it's the opportunity cost of not developing low-cost lodging versus market-rate hotels. Um, and that was kind of an odd concept to us, you know, again, absent any feasibility study and what have you. So the concept here now is that it applies um, some sort of fee, um, some sort of potential requirement for lower-cost lodging would apply when you're removing low-cost lodging and you're removing any kind of lodging. Um, so that is a compromise position from the Coastal Commission staff in moving back from just any kind of lodging. It has to be existing. Um, so that's, that's the difference in the red line, and it's, it's policy 46 um, in, your, in your draft plan. Mr. Mayor, if, if I could also clarify and confirm with staff, I believe your question may be the 25% you won't see um, in the materials. Correct, yeah. Right. And this um, this larger red line is the addendum which is proposed by staff. Mm -hmm. The piece of paper you have with the red, the red is the addition proposed by Harding Larmore. No, I understand. Okay. I understand that. But my point is, I'm trying to get so this language staff put in the language about applying the low cost lodging fee to market rate hotel development right. as a way to try to push back and get a compromise position with this the Coastal Commission on their cockamamie right. idea that. You should require 25% on-site 
affordable lodging with no definition of what affordable lodging right. is. And, right. And, and what we've put forth at this point, like where the difference is, is that we're proposing that you initially start with a fee, and then you know that fee might be waived if someone voluntarily chooses to put units on site, as opposed yes. to coming up with a random percentage on something and then having a fee. So you can see how that's that's inverted, because uh, we believe yeah. that a feasibility study could. So it's different than the HPP, where you have to either do on site or pay a higher right. fee. It's We're giving the option a, of the fee first. Correct. But if some magnanimous hotel developer said, "No, actually, I'm going to do 25 percent," right. exactly. we wouldn't preclude them from doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to the bone of contention or discussion of this language, um, the original language suggested the fee be applied to all market rate hotel rooms, that not was, net. That was where the coastal staff started. Right. And so what is this going to do? You know, I would rather in the long run go ahead and get an adopted LUP because mm -hmm. I think it's better for the city if we can get over some of these discussion points to the Coastal Commission. Is this going to be a sticking point with them on the low cost lodging if we go just to the, apply it to net new hotel rooms, or do we think they're going to be okay with it? I think that um, so b based on the discussions we've had them again conceptually, they have said net new. Um, I will say like we haven't added that language to the policy itself, so it's hard for me to say how they react because we we, we asked again in concept, but we hadn't actually put um, language. You know, in, in, in the policy, because we all agreed, like we would defer that to that to the implementation plan. Yeah. Yeah, and right. given the, yeah. given the he said she said thing, is there a brilliant way to finesse the language in this section that leaves the door open for both possibilities within the implementation plan and, and leaves yeah. the, the door open for negotiations with the coastal commission that precludes us from having to adopt their strategy? We believe that as presented right now, it does give us the flexibility to do that. To consider net new or not, and you know, but like what it is is that it actually um, does represent uh, a point of agreement, which is that it applies to all existing lodging. So that part is something that we have heard from coastal staff that they fully agree with. The point of discussion and continuing discussion is the fee and the percentage and the nature of the feasibility study. So that's I, I think it's something that we can continue to work with them on, and we're quite close. On that, it's just in, time, in terms of making it for this hearing, we just couldn't finish those conversations. All right. So, if we adopted the red line that's been proposed to us, would that cause pushback from the Coastal Commission and make them go back to their position that we should do the twenty-five percent on-site or whatever else they want? There, there, there is potentially that 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 possibility because we have not proposed that specific language before it's been talked about, like we'll talk about those details in the IP. Again, it's just been discussions in concept. So um, the way that it's drafted now, it does not close the door at all on the ability to, to um, you know, consider net new. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. I think she just left her name there, didn't you? Uh, I thought I dropped off. Oh, okay. So, so, so let me ask you this, because I think we all probably agree we want to move this process along. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems to me there are some good arguments as to why we want to focus on net new hotel rooms, for example. It'll actually constrain people if, oh, wait a minute, if I do X amount over what I currently have, I'm going to have to pay a significant marginal increase in a price per unit to construct them, that sort of thing. Um, and, and we don't want to discourage the replacement of existing hotel units. But that all having been said, is there a way to to sort of give staff direction about this without getting in the way of the train? That, yeah. So that we could say, okay, well, maybe we're not going to adopt this language tonight, mm -hmm. but we want staff to go back and attempt to negotiate effectively this language? Does that make sense? And I, I'm not quite sure how to word it. Maybe you can help me. But to, so, so that we're moving in that direction, it's staff's, staff understands it's council's intention to want to do the net new hotel rooms analysis or, or affect that, but not get in the way of the train. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, would, I would suggest that you, know, you, you um, take action on what you do tonight. And as council sometimes says, you can have if uh, staff has separate direction um, regarding policy 46, um, you know, to, to give us direction to negotiate for net new. Okay, thanks. Councilmember McEwen. 
I'll move the staff recommendation with direction to staff to pursue the net new language in uh, item 46. Second. All right, so we have a motion by McEwen. Uh, we see the city attorney jumping in. We simply need clarification in the motion that the staff recommendation is the staff recommendation as presented tonight, which uh, has the addendum, which is exhibit one to the resolution um, in cleaned up form. Of course, the cleaned up form, not the down and dirty form. That's the motion, the cleaned right, up that's form. That's the motion, uh, the cleaned up motion by Council Member McEwen, second by Mayor Pro Tem Davis, with a direction to if I understand correctly, pursue net new in item 46. Incor incor incorporate this draft language has been proposed to us. Is that correct? Not necessarily the specific language, but the but concept. something on that along those lines. All right. It's negotiable. Any further discussion? Well, then we will have a roll call vote. Councilmember McKeown? Yes. Councilmember Helmrich? Yes. Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. So, thank you for all your hard work on that. And Next maybe some of us will be around when the implementation plan comes back to council. <laughs> Next we have item 8B. It's the update of the city's performance based biannual budget and adoption of the performance management policy. And you have one request to speak. I'll bring that to you. Good evening, Council. So tonight we're presenting an update on the city's transition to reimagined performance-based budget for the fiscal year 2019 through 21 biennium. And we're also recommending the adoption of a proposed performance management policy. Our, our reimagined budget process came from our desire to be more proactive as we enter a period of long-term fiscal challenges, including steep increases in our pension costs as we address a large unfunded pension liability, a flattening and even some decreases in our most relied upon revenue streams such as sales tax and parking fees, as changes in the economy diverge from established revenue structures and a probable recession within the, past, the next two years. Our last financial forecast projected that the general fund would see a budget shortfall within the next biennial budget period if we made no changes and a recession would worsen the picture. In this landscape, we believe that a performance-based budget informed by fact-based data will help us achieve the most important functions of the city at the lowest possible cost. But there are a number of other elements that we've included into our new budget process to round out the approach. In the summer, uh, Council adopted the compensation philosophy and uh, that documents the city's approach to establishing staff compensation. We will also bring to you for adoption a fiscal sustainability philosophy that will provide a shared basis to guide budget development. We'll enhance our process to engage the community in budget priority setting, and the city manager will convene a committee of community uh, members and employees to take a deep dive into the subject of pension liability and weigh the options that we have to move forward. Finally, our move from five to 10 year for, uh, financial forecasts will help us better understand and plan for the impacts of current and upcoming fiscal constraints, as well as the life cycle costs of programs and initiatives. We expect our transition to performance-based budgeting to take at least three uh, biennial budgets. With a performance-based uh, budget model, city leaders will ultimately use data to measure how well and how effectively programs achieve the results that matter most to the community. To start in the first biennial budget process, our focus is to break down the services our departments provide into individual activities, and gauge to what extent these activities contribute to our framework outcomes and strategic goals, among other criteria. We're also costing these activities so that once we identify the highest priority services, 
we can begin to reallocate resources to enhance high-performing programs uh, that are meeting our framework outcomes. Uh, we expect to reallocate resources from low-performing programs or areas that no longer meet a pressing need, and also by reorganizing how we provide services to make sure we're doing so in the most effective and efficient way. We'll also assign metrics to each activity to inform our future decision-making. Staff recommends that Council approve a policy that institutionalizes the City's commitment to performance measurement as a, or performance management as a tool and a mechanism to achieve sustainable city, a sustainable city of well-being that works for everyone. Our Chief Performance Officer, Tim Dodd, will take you through the policy. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, so in front of you on this slide, you have the text of the full policy. Essentially, what we're asking for you to do tonight is to codify a uh, commitment of the city to performance management. Uh, it's very succinctly written and just it states exactly um, that we are a city that cares about performance management and, and how we plan to use it. Uh, this policy will become part of the financial policies uh, that are part of the budget that are published every year. Um, so read it quickly. Um, so the City of Santa Monica City Council supports the use of data to drive and inform decision making processes and deliver reliable results to create a model 21st century government and a sustainable city of well-being that works for everyone. The city will manage performance and focus resources to achieve the community-focused outcomes included in the framework for a sustainable city of well-being. Uh, this slide just shows the structure. It's a little bit of a busy slide, but it shows the structure of performance management that we're working to build. Um, it is a, a technique or a process that's called cascading which essentially means that you're connecting all the different parts of the organization uh, trying to achieve similar goals. Um, so as we are now building, we're really building the middle stage right now, the, the output part um, that'll be part of the budget um, book that we're building that we'll be presenting to you um, in June for the next uh, two fiscal years. Um, the outcome stage is something that you had approved um, in, in June as part of this current budget. Um, it is something that we are working uh, to revise that will also be approved uh, or we'll also be asking you to approve as part of the budget cycle for the next two year um, period as, or next two year period as well. Um, the inputs, so really just to kind of walk backwards. So the inputs are really where it all starts. They're really the ingredients or the things that departments and divisions have direct control over. Things like the example I have here, scheduling, um, processing types of things. They're the things that we do that departments and divisions will track internally. Um, that hopefully will, will result in outputs, which essentially are results. Um, these are high-level metrics. Um, they're process-based metrics. Um, they will be a part of the budget book. Right now, we're working through a process um, of mapping uh, every department's activities, uh, services and activities, um, and each activity will have an output metric. Um, and then, obviously, the, the goal is that they will all tie to outcomes, which really is the ideal state. It's kind of what we're trying to achieve. The outcome metrics that are part of the framework now really are what we're using to basically define, did we achieve what we're looking to achieve with community or place and planet or, or, or whatever, uh, whichever of the seven outcome areas. So this is really the, a slide that shows the structure that we're trying to build in the city with performance management. Um, and then this, this just shows how, so on the left um, is the structure I just went over of inputs, outputs, and outcome metrics. And this just shows how what we're using for tools to both do management and reporting. So the dashboard that I believe I quickly mentioned uh, last time I, I was before you in June, um, and you approved uh, the contract amendment for this last January, uh, we are working uh, to develop this. Staff did receive an update um, on progress. The idea and the hope is that this will be something that can hopefully go live this spring, um, but it will be a dashboard that will be part of the reimagined uh, budget, I'm sorry, excuse me, reimagined website um, that is being built by the city as well, um, that will show our success in achieving the outcome metrics. And then SAMOSTAT is uh, the process that we use to basically monitor um, our progress in achieving the goals that are part of this process. So then I'll turn it back to um, Finance Director to go through the rest of the presentation. Okay, so what on uh, the slide before you, you uh, we've, we're presenting a timeline for um, where we're heading next, and we had talked about uh, the community outreach uh, element of the reimagined budget. Um, we are including additional opportunities for council to guide budget development, and um, this slide is showing the um, how and when we'll reach out to the community and to the council. So. 
The city manager is going to be holding meetings with the pension advisory committee from October to December and potentially uh, a little bit later than that uh, to reach consensus on a plan that will address our unfunded li that could address our unfunded pension liability with the goal that the committee's recommendations to the city manager will be available to share with the council in January of 2019. Um, starting this month, um, staff will work on issuing a citywide survey to gather input on community priorities and throughout the next six months we'll schedule community conversations and pop-up engagements at city events where council members and staff can build a stronger understanding of the new budgeting process and also learn which outcome and sub outcome areas are most relevant to community members in january uh, in addition to the regular mid-year budget council meeting that uh, includes the presentation of the city's financial forecast, um, council will hold a separate retreat to confirm the budget priorities for the next biennial. To and to support your discussion, staff will provide updates to everything that we've talked about this evening. Uh, the work identifying citywide services and activities, the work of the pension advisory committee, feedback from the various community engagement efforts, and updates on the progress of uh, the programs that we're working on as part of our strategic goals. Uh, in April, um, we will return to council with a preview of high level budget decisions for fiscal year 19 through 21. Uh, they will include potential trade-offs as we seek to close the projected fiscal year 2021 budget shortfall uh, in the general fund and reallocate the resources to outcome areas that may require greater investment. They may also include discontinuation of services or activities um, or reallocations to improve efficiency. Uh, Council will um, consider the final proposed budget at its May budget study session in time for adoption in June of 2019. So you'll see here that we do have an additional meeting in April that we haven't had in the past uh, with the Council. So to conclude, we're asking Council to approve the proposed performance management policy and uh, we're here and available to answer any questions. That concludes our report. Thank you. I believe we're going to have to hear from the City Manager as well. So first of all, uh, thank you Gigi and Tim for um, presenting this report to the Council and to the community. Um, we of course have a um, Council Chamber packed with um, community and civic leaders and activists who are hanging on every word of uh, this critically important presentation. Um, they left after we lowered the weight limit on the pear bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, is, it is true here in Santa Monica and it's true in, in um, virtually all local governments that when the topic of budgets comes up, people's eyes glaze over. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, they stay away in droves. Um, the reality, though, is that it's, I believe, the most important decision you make every year. Um, former Vice President Biden once famously said that a budget is a statement of values. Um, and that's really what tonight's presentation is about. Santa Monica values certain fundamental priorities and goals. We call them strategic goals. They're, they're um, Im embedded in the framework that you adopted in the last biennial. And our goal is to create a sustainable city of well-being and to end the idea that there are council goals and community goals and budget goals. There's, there's really um, those are all the same thing because nothing ever gets done unless you allocate money and staff time to it. Um, and it's not enough to allocate money and staff time to it. You need to be hold us accountable for producing the results that the money and the staff time is invested in producing. So I'm, we're going to talk a lot about um, this, not just here in the council chambers, but out in the community to connect not only um, our day-to-day -day performance uh, to, to your budget decisions, but also to connect the community to the importance of the budget decision-making process. Um, 
I, I, I would conclude with two things. Um, the first is we are going to ask you to make the hardest choices this council has made in many years. Um, the, it will begin with this two-year budget cycle, but we'll, we'll continue over the next three because there needs to be fundamental shifting uh, in how we spend our money in order to create a government that works better and costs less. If we aren't successful in making a government that works better and costs less, um, we will not be able to tackle the very fundamental existential challenge of meeting our pension liabilities. As I've said many times, we are in far better financial shape than the vast majority of California cities. I don't say that because um, I'm the city manager of Santa Monica. That's what all three rating agencies, um, national rating agencies say. That's what any objective uh, comparison of city balance sheets would say. That's what any objective analysis of how much we have done proactively to meet our pension obligations by adopting an, uh, a lower tier before the state made its reforms, by asking our staff to uh, contribute more uh, than is legally required toward their future pensions, um, by putting an unprecedented amount of money on the table um, to pay down our um, pension obligations, and by convening uh, this pension advisory committee uh, to continue to take steps to deal with this. But all of that is ultimately tied to finding the resources uh, so we're not reducing services to our community while still retiring this pension obligation. That is a tough set of choices. And we have not had to make tough choices because we have managed this city well over the past 30 years. And I say we, that wasn't me, I mean the the dedicated staff and the enlightened um, city council and an informed and active community. We're going to be asking all of you, our, our staff, our community, and our council to make some hard choices in uh, the next six years so that we are continue to be fiscally sustainable. Last thing is um, I want to thank, uh, again, the assistant city manager and our chief financial officer and our chief performance officer and our, our budget manager, and all of the people who have been working with those four leaders um, on this process. We really are fundamentally um, improving an already excellent best practice budget process. Um, and the amount of time, effort, and dedication that's gone in even to this point is really quite extraordinary. But the reason is not just so we have a better budget process so we can win awards or so we can pat ourselves on the back. The reason is, is that if we're going to continue to provide an excellent level of services to this community over the next 20 or 30 years, we are going to have to get our arms around this pension challenge. We're going to have to get our arms around it at a time of, of flattening revenues as, as our chief financial officer continues to emphasize. We can do it. We will do it but it will require a lot of hard work and a lot of hard choices, and it will require more people than are in the audience tonight. Councilmember Hillerich. Um, yeah, I, I have one question about the um, performance management policy, and that is this. Um, whether this performance management policy actually allows us the kind of flexibility that we've been talking about a lot lately and the ability, um, it, it just sounds, and I could be wrong, rigid to me. And when we talk about pilots and flexibility, I just wonder if we ought to um, have something in the philosophy about that. I, I think we were trying to keep it as succinct as possible. We certainly don't see it as rigid, um, things that are data-driven. Um, are are meant to to be flexible. If, if the data tells us if something's not working, then we change it. If something is telling us it's working, then we do more of it. Um, but if the council has language, we certainly agree with with the need to do more innovative, nimble, um, and responsive 
uh, initiatives. Um, so if, if you have some suggested language that would capture that, or if you want us to work on some language to capture that, again, we are trying to keep this as, as succinct as possible. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, um, you know, this is, um, I, I like the word responsive. I think that that's good. I, I mean, I, it just sounds as if this is, um, uh, but I, well, it's we hard could, for you me know, to do it on the We fly. could add two words um, that might send a strong signal, council member, if your colleagues agree. The city will manage performance and focus resources to be responsive in achieving the community-focused outcomes included in the framework for sustainable city of well-being. Uh, I mean, I would like that. I think it sort of doesn't say much, but it captures. I, I think it doesn't. Uh, but I, um, I, I why think don't that that's we good think about it and hear okay. it from the one public speaker? And that is, if okay, you ask a question, how about that? I didn't know there was a public. Speaker. Yes, Ms. Barton. You have one minute, it looks like. And good evening. I wonder if the original document posted with this item saying you were going to give downtown Santa Monica Inc. $7 million for their ambassador in the park program, going to shuffle unqualified city staff, and how you're going to do parking however you wanted to, conflicting with what you proclaimed in item 8A, was the missing attachment A. Although what's most interesting is how the residents are left out. Now please allow me to share with you the claim, the complaint that I made yesterday to the city attorney's office. Please allow me to explain the links for the, the local coastal program and use plan like which usually goes with links, which usually go with the document where the changes were made did not work. Then for item 8B, there was a reference in an, in an attachment A, which was not there. So since these two items were not posted in their entirety 72 hours before the city council meeting, I'm requesting that they be removed from the city October 9, 2018 city council meeting. And since they were not removed, would that show unprofessionalism, corruption, or racketeering? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barton. And now the council, the matter is back before us. Um, we have received the update on the city's transition to reimagine performance based biennial budget, and it's the recommendation is to approve this performance managed policy. And Council Member Hemorich may want to suggest the addition of a couple words or not. Um, council Member McCune's in the queue, though. I'm for this. Do you like beer? Mayor <laughs> uh, Davis. Well, I, I too am for this, but I'm going to be a little more long-winded, um, which is that I, I certainly support this process. I just want to make sure, um, I think we all agree that data is important, but some things are more susceptible to being quantified than others. Um, and And so from, as everyone knows, I think I care about, uh, you know, being a sustainable city of well-being, and while there are certainly metrics like readiness for kindergarten and other things we can measure there, there are probably some outcomes that'll just be a little hard, and I don't want the fact that it's hard to measure something to suggest that, well, then that's something that we shouldn't include. Um, so I just, I just want to express that concern and make sure there's that sensitivity that the things that we might not be able to make really nice metrics for may still be worth doing. Um, and there may be, we may have to look for some unique ways to measure outcomes, um, which I'm all for, but I just want to make sure that we don't lose that human touch. Council Member Okay, well that sort of leads back into what you, was, You'll need to turn on your microphone. That sort of leads to, to what I was talking about because I think that Sometimes you stumble into things, you know, in, in, uh, and so maybe, um, and I like the word responsive, right? So uh, to drive and inform responsive decision-making processes. Uh, so reliable results, I think, is the thing that makes me feel as if this is a little bit 
constrictive because sometimes you take a chance and uh, uh, and you might not know what you're going to get at the end if you do a pilot, for instance. So, um, so could you say? Uh, 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 maybe it would be um, creative and reliable results or something like that. I mean. Let's ask the city attorney a question. This is a performance manage management policy. It's not an ordinance. If it's just a policy, it doesn't preclude us from measuring outcomes in ways other than data or from pilot programs or any of the concerns that Council Member Himmlich has espoused, does it? I would invite the city manager's thoughts as well. A policy is not going to uh, bind you in that way, but it will be a guiding document for staff for a period to come. And so we will look to it and we would point people to it um, in the absence of further direction from you. But certainly any ordinance or resolution that you adopted, um, uh, any ordinance you adopt will be city law over and above this policy. So do the, having heard a couple of minor concerns espoused, does the left side of the dais have any suggestions on succinct, concise language that would address those concerns? Yeah. Um, you only need to use your microphone too. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, reliable, uh, let, me, let me defend reliable and then exceed, ex hold on, <laughs> exceed to, there may be a better word. Um, reliable is one of the five R's of teamwork that, that's been part of the city's um, uh, internal culture. And re reliable is meant to suggest, um, you know, essentially systematic so that if, uh, as you often say, Councilmember Hemmerich, um, you know, picking up the garbage, that's, that's a service where we want to reliably do that um, very successfully uh, day in, day out, week in, week out. Nonetheless, that may not be the most, I mean, of, of all the words we could choose, that may not be the, that may send some, some, some wrong signals. Um, so I think uh, clearly one of the values that, that has been part of our conversation has been innovation. And so, uh, and part of um, uh, what has been the conversation around uh, the council dais has been strategic. Uh, and then you've mentioned the word responsive. If those, if those words get at the concerns of you and your colleagues, um, if you give us a couple of minutes, we can try to craft them so we're not just shoehorning them in as buzzwords, but try to create a sentence that that makes well, some sense. When you say innovative, I think if you said to drive and inform innovative decision making processes. Yeah, I don't think the process, the, the, I don't think what we're looking for is innovative decision making processes. I think we're, we're, we're looking for innovative approaches to solving problems. Um, so those are two different things. Um, and again, I think if, okay. if those are, if, if that captures the concepts, if you give us a couple minutes, we can probably translate that into verbiage. Councilmember McEwen. If I could make a very quick suggestion, uh, replace reliable with responsive. Then you're delivering responsive results. They're responsive to the data, but they're also responsive to the community. Yeah. Well done. I support this. Okay. And, uh, and I happen to know you don't drink beer, so you're. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Right. I mean, actually, I was. I, Maybe we're all on our words or something, but because um, I was even thinking something sort of bland, like reportable, because I think that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a system where we can tell people, we took your money, we spent it, this is what you got for it. I mean, something at that very basic level. But I'm, but I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine with, with uh, Councilmember McEwen's proposed change. I think responsive is fine. I, I mean, in some respects, trying to define the results without knowing what the results are, I think, is the issue we're struggling with um, because we don't want to prejudge the results. We don't want to say positive results. They may not be positive results, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm fine with I, I think the language is less important than the fact that staff understands our concerns. So I'm sort of amenable to almost any language as long as it doesn't nullify. Councilmember O'Connor. 
Delete reliable, just say deliver result. Um, but but I, I'm not I, I gonna, like the response. I'm not gonna fight for that. I'm sorry, no, I like the response. If I agree, that's fine with me. That sort of captures it all. Yeah. Okay, Council Member McEwen. I move we adopt this policy with the word responsive. In place of reliable. That works for me too. And then you're on mute for most of the time. I second. <laughs> and and uh, I was waiting. <laughs> and and that uh, I'm not a I'm not a decision maker here, Councilmember. But let me make a suggestion as a nod to. First of all, we totally agree with the the sentiments expressed by both council members, Council Member Himmelrich and um, Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Um, and so, substituting responsive for reliable makes makes sense. We're totally fine with that. It may be that, that um, it's redundant and making this more succinct um, if we took out inform, uh, drive and inform decision making because really data should drive results not drive decision making. It should inform decision making. So if we, so if we uh, um, took out an, um, drive and uh, that would, would um, I think address more, more uh, succinctly. That's friendly to the, the maker of the motion. And the second. Yeah. All right. So the motion on the floor by Councilmember McEwen and a second by Councilmember Himmelich is that the performance management policy should be the City of Santa Monica City Council supports the use of data to inform decision making processes and deliver responsive results to create a model 21st century government and sustainable city of well being that works for everyone. And the last sentence remains the same. That is correct. So let's have a roll call vote. Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Councilmember Helmerich? Yes. Councilmember McKim? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. And, and Mayor and Council Members, we appreciate um, you engaging with this language and giving us clear direction. Um, the goal here is to be, is to have the budget process be driven by you and the priorities you and the community want to see achieved, not just the legacy of past um, inertia, uh, but let's let's see if we can devote our resources, pinpoint them where they'll have the biggest bang for the buck on the things you believe are most important um, for our community. And you set that through um, 30 years of commitment to, to environmental sustainability, broadly defined to include equity and uh, the economy uh, through nationally and even internationally significant work around well-being um, over the last five years. And all of that distilled into a legacy of nearly 150 years of service delivery uh, to the community that's really unmatched in Southern California. We're trying to put all that together um, and strip the strip out the things that aren't working as well or are are simply uh, legacy programs um, and to improve the ones that we deliver so so we can um, ensure that next the next generation of Santa Monicans um, have just as strong a fiscal foundation as as you have left this generation. Thank you for that. And that concludes this item. Uh, we have voted earlier to continue item 13A to 13C. So the clerk can please call item 13D. 13D is recommendation to accept Barbara Kaufman's resignation from the Building and Fire Life Safety Commission and authorize the city clerk to publish the vacancy. And you have no request to speak. Move we do so with regret. All right, moved by McEwen and uh, second by Hemorrhage to accept Barbara Kaufman's resignation from the Building and Fire Life Safety Commission. We can do this by a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? Moving on to 13E, please. 13E is recommendation to accept Marsha Ferreira's resignation from the Commission on the Status of Women and authorize the city clerk to publish the vacancy. And you have no request to speak. Move to accept with regrets. Second. 
All right, moved by Himmler, second by Davis, to accept Marcia Ferreira's resignation from the Commission on the Status of Women with Regrets. And we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Next, we have 13F, request of Mayor Winter and Mayor Pro Tem Davis that the council allocate $20,000 of council discretion, discretionary funds as a matching grant to Samuel High Choral Music to provide partial scholarships to low-income students to participate in the biannual European Choral Trip. The funds will be distributed to Santa Monica Arts Parents Association, Vocal Music, a 501c3 nonprofit, and you have no request to speak. You have no request to speak, but I see people coming here like they might want to speak. Ideally, you would have done it on the table out there. Oh, we see out there? I'm sorry. oh well, fill it out there, and we'll filibuster a bit since you came all the way down here at this time of evening. Gosh, Mayor, what's this item about? <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain a bit. Uh, you know, we have in our past history uh, regularly awarded money to uh, various school groups to travel. Um, uh, and to provide money for partial scholarships to the low-income students who want to participate on those musical trips. Um, it's part of our overall philosophy of creating a community that learns and thrives and also of our philosophy of being inclusive, diverse, to make sure that people with, uh, from our lower-income households have the opportunity to go be ambassadors of Santa Monica and to enrich their lives by learning more about music abroad. So we probably don't need to be talked into this. No, yeah. but I, I sort of feel if somebody <laughs> came down. But there's a chance. Yeah. Uh -huh. It really should have come down on a screen. So, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Pro Tem Davis, did you want to add anything? I think you summed it up. All right. Uh, so we are going to hear for two minutes from Aaron Inetsugu, Sophie Gole, and James Bertelro. Brian. <laughs> Brian. Thank you so much. Sorry for the confusion about that. We were looking at your, what you were on and didn't realize that we were up next. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, my name is Erin Inatsugu. I am the president of the Santa Monica High School Choral Steering Committee, and I appreciate the time that you're taking to hear from us tonight. Um, the Santa Monica City Council has a history of being supportive of our international tours, and we are so grateful for that support. Uh, we are here tonight to ask again for your support for the 2019 um, Advanced Ensembles Concert Tour of France, which will be happening in April of 2019. Um, we are asking in the amount of $20,000, which as you mentioned would be used to support scholarship funding for all of our students to be able to attend and take part in this amazing educational opportunity. Um, I'd like to introduce our choir co-presidents, Sophie Golay and James Bryan. Hi, uh, my name is James, this is Sophie, and we'd just like to personally thank you for your continued support of the Santa Monica Arts Program. Um, it's been really helpful to me, and it's been really helpful to Sophie, and it's been helpful to hundreds of other students in Samo High and all the districts that feed it, or schools that feed into it. Um, we just wanted to let you know that providing us with this generous grant would be so helpful for helping our um, advanced choirs spend 10 days in France singing in amazing cathedrals, historical venues, and even in Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. And uh, I'd also like to add that um, all the funds that are raised by are in the gift by you will actually match with our fundraising. That is our current goal, and we're well on the way to that. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Mayor Tim Davis? Well, um, you know, I, this is one of the fun things we get to do. I mean, we did get to adjust the weight limits on the pier bridge, but this is a close second. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's wonderful because these are, of course, wonderful programs. And for those people who might wonder why is it appropriate for the city to fund um, what is essentially a program of the school district. It's twofold, and the mayor set it forth, which is one is it promotes our learn and thrive strategic goal because we know that music programs are an integral part of making sure that all our students have great educations, and two, the diversity aspect of it because the purpose of our giving money is to help those students who would not otherwise be able to go. 
Um, you know, there are certainly some parents in our district who are fully able to fund their children, and that's wonderful. But we don't want the decision about whether or not a particular student can go to be based on whether or not they have the economic wherewithal to go. So our money is directed to those students who would not otherwise be able to go. And with that lengthy explanation, I will move the item. Second. And we're giving money, so seeing no further discussion, we'll have a roll call vote. Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Councilmember McCune? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. So congratulations. Next, we have 13F. It's the request of Mayor Winter and Mayor Pro Tem Davis. That's a council allocate $20,000 of council discretionary funds as a matching grant to the Samuel High Win Ensemble to provide scholarships to low-income students to participate in the Rome Tour from April 6th through 13th, 2019. The funds will be distributed to Santa Monica Arts Parents Association at 501c3, and you have one request to speak. You want to take this one, Mayor Potem? Sure. Uh, this is very similar to the one we just did. It's just a different music group, the Wind Ensemble. Uh, unlike the Choral Ensemble, has not traveled to Europe all that frequently. In fact, the letter they sent suggests this is their first opportunity. And so it's very exciting to be able to extend that opportunity to another wonderful musical group at Sam Ohai. As before, this is, of course, part of our Learn and Thrive initiative, meaning that students exposed to music, we all know, um, perform better in school in all their classes, not just in music. And again, this is money that will be directed towards students who would not otherwise be able to attend this wonderful tour where they will be in Rome, apparently. I am so jealous. How do I sign on as a uh, uh, chaperone? I was looking for that word. It's late at night. But anyway, it sounds like it's going to be a wonderful trip. Did we have a request to speak? We do. Okay, and I then I will shut up. This request would be for funds that would be matched by their own fundraising efforts. And we have one request to speak from Elisa Stewart. Good evening. I am Elisa Stewart. I'm the president of the Samuel High Band Parents Association, and we are very excited and a little bit scared and nervous. We're new to this, and this is why our tour coordinator, uh, Jennifer Raymond, came and we sat through the whole meeting because we didn't quite quite sure how this worked. And we are very grateful that you're considering this request. We we are already hard at work raising. We're, we're trying to raise forty thousand dollars in addition to this twenty because we do have a, a quite a bit of scholarship need. I am getting phone calls all the time uh, from you know, worried moms and dads. You know, we really want him to go. But, and, and I like, don't worry about it. We will make this work. We're confident and we just extremely grateful for your support. Well, thank you for that. And I hope you learned a lot about the other business we attended to this evening. <laughs> Uh, and with that, I will make the motion that we allocate this $20,000 of the council discretionary funds to the Sam High Wind Ensemble to provide scholarships for low-income students to participate in the Rome Tour from April 6th to 13th, 2019. I'll second it. All right. Council Member McEwen? I just want to say. Good. My turn to be told to turn yeah. the mic on. <laughs> I just want to say for the record that the money is going to a 501c3 as it was on the previous item. I just completed a 25-year career working for the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. So for about another eight or nine months now, I'm not able to vote on any money going to the school district until my my weight in the, uh, I guess it's like the off the off box on a hockey rink. I'm not allowed to play for yeah. part of the next period. Uh, but this is not going to the school district, so that's why I didn't have to recuse myself. Could you also, I mean, it is interesting that the letters attached to the 13 item is signed by Kevin McEwen, director Santa Monica High School Band. You may want to clear up any confusion that might cause. Many people over the years seeing me at so many community meetings have wondered if I'm cloned, but no. <laughs> What it is, there are two Kevin McKeones in Santa Monica. Um, when I first got on the council, I used to get uh, messages in my answering machine from young girls looking for Kevin, and I didn't <laughs> quite understand what that was about. Uh, and then when I ran for council, Kevin McKeon, the other one, was quite surprised to see his name on lawn signs all over town. Uh, we have become friends. I first met his mother, Josephine, but then I met Kevin, and we worked together at the school district. I had the name first, uh, but we have agreed to share it. Right. So this is a different Kevin McEwen on the letter than you. So it's just wanted to make sure people were aware of that. I thank you for that clarification because I was at the Sam Ohai uh, well, homecoming event on when the band performed on Friday night and there was Kevin McEwen. I thought that was you. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Great. Okay, so we have a motion. We're going to spend some money. We need to do a roll call vote. Councilmember McKim? Yes. Councilmember Hemmerich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Councilmember O'Connor? Yes. And Mayor Winter? Yes. Congratulations, and we look forward to hearing from both musical groups about their trips abroad. And go forth, prosper, learn, and thrive. Thank you. And that now brings us to item 14. Public input. Public comment is permitted only on items not on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. State law prohibits that the city council prohibits the city council from taking any action on items not listed on the agenda, including issues raised under this agenda item. And you have three requests to speak. All right, we'll start off with Turin Osbilan, followed by Denise Martin and Art Casillas. Is there a Turin Osbilan here? I think that's him. Oh. Thank you, Mayor Winter and Councilwoman. Uh, basically, I just wanted to bring up a, a couple of things about the homeless awareness, uh, the problems, and the recycled problems that we have in Santa Monica. I have a proposal. I'm just new to this, too, so I was just sitting back watching and learning. So if I say a couple things wrong, I do apologize. Uh, so I just found out I have to send out an email my digital slideshow. So I'm going to do that next time, and then I could talk more about uh, the things I like to propose to try to help the homeless problem and the recycle problem that we have in Santa Monica. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Barton. Good evening. Tonight I'd like to address the City Council agendas, including the posting of them since Rick Cole has been, an, has been City Manager. First, on the consent calendar, one does have to really wonder if you have so many items because you don't want the residents to be able to address all the items they want to. The agenda was posted in full for years on the Tuesday night, a week before the City Council meeting. Now residents don't have access to it until the Thursday night before the City Council meeting. Just like this one, where staff administrative items A and B, A, a and B, had no information, but staff reports will be available later until that time. Come on, you had almost a month between city council meetings. Or would this be the real performance you're, you're paying for in your performance-based budget? The more you put the residents at a disadvantage, the more you get paid. Because from Tanya and Bernice in the city clerk's office refusing to answer my questions as to why this continues happening, that's the way it looks. Or again, would this be the reason he gave the department heads responsibility for oversight to the department, so he can say it's not my fault? And then I'm also hearing rumors that the city council meetings are being edited again to fit within specific time periods. Here I have to ask if you do not remember when you were removing my presentations from the replays of city council meetings, because I see this action is no different. The city council meeting should be replayed and retained, including its original form and content. I also believe that you were contacted by the FCC in my situation of being edited out of city council meeting replays. So if I notice or continue to hear rumors, I have no choice but to call them again, making you a repeat offender. Thank you. Mr. Casillas. Good evening, Art Casillas. Now is our chance to vote out McEwen, Himmelrich, O'Connor, now. They live north of Wilshire and all white. The problem is police can't clean up break-ins, burglaries, rapes, and shots fired and drugs in north of Wilshire because it would become too obvious these racists have really been letting Pico neighborhood allowed and enabled with drugs for years. It's also been a smoke screen to keep blacks and Mexicans out of north of Wilshire, NIMBY. Strange, all police chiefs from 1991 till present are, are to make a, asked to make a plan for beach tourists and homeless, but not in your nor our neighborhoods with more calls for service than ever. Only police department and fire department make more overtime pay and benefits because city manager dangerous Rick Cole was hired to close his eyes and take the blame. In Santa Monica Daily Press, Friday, October 5th, 2018, Lieutenant Saul Rodriguez says, Position 40, Proposition 47 is why it doesn't pay to arrest crimes of opiates, methamphetamines, and heroin. 
is a lie and a distortion which allows for more crime and overtime for him and his accomplices. accomplices. Also, Lieutenant Rodriguez says he worked drugs for 11 years, then why are you still allowing shots, fired heroin, and methamphetamines to be sold from rent control apartments on Cloverfield Hill behind my 70-year-old brother's house? It's that, how you, is that how you're trying to shut me up? The Department of Justice must take Santa Monica Police Department under receivership for willful endangerment to us for profit. Is that correct, City Attorney Dilch? God does not deserve this, nor do we. Dangerous Rick Cole. That concludes the public input. Um, it says here somebody is going to adjourn the memory of Joan Goldsmith. That would be me. Um, it's with great sadness that we adjourn this council meeting in memory of Joan Goldsmith. She was a longtime Santa Monica resident, and she was the former head librarian at Samurai. Uh, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. She sadly passed away after battling stage four lung cancer. During the 1970s, Joan was a head librarian with the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District and worked at Samo High. She was known for collaborating with peers in the region to discuss issues like the summer reading program, books on tape, friends of the library, and the adoptions of materials and cataloging. All heavy librarian stuff, as you probably know. Joan enjoyed our own Santa Monica Public Library system. She visited often to check out books. She was an avid Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim baseball fan, and former colleagues described Joan as generous, kind-hearted, intelligent, nurturing, and a positive influence on all those whose lives she touched. Speaking on behalf of the entire community, we convey to Joan Goldsmith's family our deepest condolences. Thank you for that, Council Member. Um, with that, we are adjourned until October 23rd.